Back in college, I entered a tournament as a condler on Rodman Reservoir in Ocala National Forest. Boater told me to meet him at the lake at 5 a.m. I hit the road around 3.30 a.m., should put me there about 15 minutes early. I'm driving through Ocala National Forest, and the fog this particulate morning is thick. I'm probably driving 30 in a 55 due to the limited visibility. I come around a corner and all of the sudden, I see the whitest lady I've ever seen in my life walking towards me in the lane. Clearly just substance abuse going on, but could easily pass for a zombie ghost. I pull into the oncoming traffic lane and hit my brakes to miss her. I come to a stop about 15 feet past her and watch her turn around like a zombie and start walking towards my truck. I went ahead and got out of there. Since then I've had a similar thing happen in almost the same area with a regular looking guy that appeared to have a bit too much to drink. Another time, guy just crossing the road around midnight, no vehicles around. I've got several buddies that have similar stories of people walking in the oncoming lane seemingly in the middle of nowhere out in the Ocala National Forest, and they had to swerve to miss them. Weird thing is it always seems to happen 5-10 miles from the closest building that shows up on the map, and these aren't hikers. No clue what these people are doing out there. It all started on a quiet summer night in Wisconsin. I was visiting a friend's cabin deep in the woods, away from the hustle and bustle of city life. It was a perfect escape, or so I thought. We were sitting around the campfire, swapping stories and laughing, when suddenly I felt a strange sensation. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it was as if we were being watched. I scanned the dark forest around us, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Later that night, as I was walking back to the cabin from the outhouse, I caught a glimpse of something that sent a shiver down my spine. Red glowing eyes stared at me from the darkness, watching my every move. I couldn't see the creature's body, but the intensity of its gaze was enough to make me hurry back to the safety of the cabin. I didn't mention the encounter to my friends, not wanting to scare them or be labeled as a paranoid city slicker. But the image of those red eyes haunted me for the remainder of the trip. A few years later, I found myself in Pennsylvania on a camping trip with some buddies. We had chosen a remote location, surrounded by dense woods and miles from the nearest town. Once again, I felt that familiar sense of being watched, and my mind drifted back to that night in Wisconsin. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we huddled around the campfire, its warm glow providing some comfort against the encroaching darkness. We chatted and roasted marshmallows, trying to ignore the eerie stillness of the woods around us. When nature called, I hesitated, remembering my previous encounter. But eventually, I couldn't put it off any longer. As I ventured away from the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling of being followed. And then, it happened again. Those same red glowing eyes appeared in the darkness, watching me intently. I stood there, frozen in fear, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature remained hidden, its body obscured by the shadows. But something told me it was a dogman, a legendary creature said to roam the woods of the Midwest and the East Coast. If I had seen its body, I'm sure I would be even more terrified than I already was. I hurried back to the campsite, my mind racing with thoughts of the mysterious creature. I shared my encounter with my friends this time, and we decided to pack up and leave first thing in the morning. To this day, I can't help but wonder what might have happened if I'd seen the full form of the creature with the red glowing eyes. Would I be more heavily affected by the encounters, unable to enjoy the serenity of the woods, or would I have come face to face with a legend, forever changing my perception of the unknown? All I know for sure is that those two encounters have left me with a deep respect for the mysteries that still linger in the wilderness, a reminder that we may never fully understand the secrets that lie hidden in the shadows. In a world where the truth is meticulously controlled by the government, every record, Every piece of history is carefully curated to fit a specific narrative. As a government archivist, my days were filled with sifting through documents, ensuring that the official history remained untarnished. My name is Eva, and I was a cog in this intricate machine of manipulation, 
until the day I stumbled upon a cache of classified government files that shattered everything I thought I knew. It was an ordinary day or so it seemed as I delved into a pile of documents marked with a level of classification that sent a shiver down my spine. I expected the usual mundane reports, but what I found was beyond comprehension. The files contained evidence of over 5,000 cryptids that had been encountered since 2023. Creatures that defied explanation, lurking in the shadows of our carefully constructed reality. As I read through the reports, my heart raced with a mixture of excitement and fear. These documents had the power to rewrite history, to expose the hidden truths that the government had been suppressing for years. The existence of these cryptids challenged everything I had been taught to believe, and I knew that the world deserved to know the truth. My decision was made in an instant. I had to expose this revelation to the public. But I was not alone in my discovery. As I meticulously gathered evidence and pieced together the puzzle, I could feel the eyes of powerful forces upon me. A brilliant but enigmatic CIA operative named Donovan and a stern army general named Harrington began pursuing me relentlessly. The chase was on, and I found myself in a deadly game of cat and mouse. Donovan's intellect was matched only by his resourcefulness, and he seemed to anticipate my every move. General Harrington, on the other hand, was a force of military precision, using his influence to cut off my escape routes and corner me at every turn. With each step I took to expose the truth, the danger escalated. Donovan and Harrington were not just trying to silence me. They were trying to control the narrative, to maintain the government's iron grip on information. The more I uncovered, the clearer it became that the cryptids were not just anomalies. They possessed powers beyond our understanding. Powers that could tip the balance of power in unimaginable ways. As the pursuit intensified, I found myself torn between my duty to reveal the truth and the overwhelming fear of the consequences. Were these cryptids truly the key to a new era of enlightenment, or were they harbingers of chaos? The more I learned, the less certain I became. Unfortunately, I failed. Once they caught me, they told me that they'll not only kill me, but all my family if I continue to leak the forbidden information. I had to comply. At least for now. I was on a weekend canoeing trip for rest and relaxation in a remote area of Rough River State Park, Kentucky. The date was June 24, 2003. Strangely, I felt queasy and anxious for some unknown reason, as if I had something to fear. Heeding these sensations, I was extremely cautious on the river. After several miles, I paddled the canoe to the riverbank and tied it off to a tree. I got out to explore the area. Looking eight, ten feet downstream, I spotted what looked like the top of a gray clay jar peeking out of the water. My first thoughts were that I might have found a native people's artifact. I started down the bank toward the creek, which was extremely slippery with mud. I stopped just short of the water and very close to the old earthenware pot. It was more like a clay crock, and I soon realized that it probably wasn't very old. I poked at it and noticed there were small handprints on it. I thought they could have been raccoon prints, but they were more like little human handprints about an inch wide. I tried to pry the thing loose using a stick, but suddenly heard a noise. I heard what sounded like children laughing in the distance. The sound was coming from downstream. When I managed to pull the crock jar out of the mud, something let out a scream. It sounded like a little girl, very high-pitched and loud. Not knowing what to do, I grabbed the jar and began to scramble up the muddy bank. Glancing back, I thought I saw something move along the creek. I stopped and sat at the top of the bank for a moment, looking at the jar, trying to comprehend the handprints. After a few minutes, I laid the crock down, got up, and walked along the creek, stopping every once in a while to peek through the bushes to see if anybody was there. At one point, I looked over the bank and noticed two little people standing about one foot tall. They had pale skins, little brown leather pants held up by suspenders, no shirts, and little pointy hats made of what looked like leather. They had leather foot coverings that went up past the ankle. Their hair was reddish in color and their eyes blue. Their hands were only about an inch wide. They knew I was watching, 
but they continued their task of pulling some kind of wooden stump down the muddy creek bank with long leather ropes or strings. These little men were surprisingly clean for the work they were doing. I then heard a thump back where I first had gone in the creek. I looked back and there were three more of the little men, exactly like the first two. They had pushed the crock jar back down the bank. They were all laughing, high-pitched laughter like a bunch of kids. I then heard a loud snap and they were all gone. Their footprints were plainly visible in the mud, but they were gone, along with the crock jar and the wooden stump. They had vanished in a split second. I walked around in an attempt to pick up a trail, but to no avail. I continued my trip with no other incidents. It was December 2000 and the winter chill had settled in. I lived in a small town called Molala, located southeast of Oregon. The snowy hills off Hunter Road were a popular spot for hiking and exploring and I had decided to venture out that day to enjoy the tranquility of nature. I had always been fascinated by the mysterious stories of Bigfoot, but never truly believed in its existence. Little did I know that my perspective would change drastically during that fateful hike. As I trudged through the soft snow, enjoying the crisp air and the crunch of snow beneath my boots, I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I found a set of tracks unlike any I had ever seen before. There were a dozen of them, each measuring 14 inches in length, with an astonishing stride of five and a half feet. The elevation of the area was about 1 in 500 feet, and the remoteness of the location added to the eeriness of the discovery. I couldn't believe my eyes. The tracks were clearly not human, nor did they resemble any known animal in the area. My heart raced as I considered the possibility that these tracks could belong to the elusive Bigfoot. I decided to follow the tracks, curious to see where they would lead. As I continued on, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. I was acutely aware of the eerie silence around me, punctuated only by the crunch of my footsteps and the occasional rustle of a bird or squirrel in the trees. Despite my apprehension, I pressed on, driven by a burning curiosity. The tracks led me deeper into the hills, and I began to wonder if I was on the verge of making a groundbreaking discovery. Suddenly, the tracks stopped at the edge of a small clearing. I scanned the area, searching for any sign of the creature that had left the tracks. But there was nothing. No broken branches, no tufts of fur, no lingering scent. It was as if the creature had simply vanished. Disappointed and feeling a mix of fear and fascination, I decided it was time to head back. I retraced my steps, making sure to take photos of the tracks as proof of my encounter. When I returned to town, I shared my story with friends and family. Some were skeptical, while others excitedly shared their own theories and stories about the legendary creature. As for me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had come incredibly close to uncovering the truth about Bigfoot. That day in December 2000 marked the beginning of my obsession with the mysterious creature. Since then, I've dedicated my life to searching for evidence and learning all I can about Bigfoot. And though I've never come as close to the creature as I did that day, the memory of those tracks in the hills off Hunter Road continues to fuel my determination to uncover the truth. As I stared at the lifeless body of my best friend, I knew I couldn't let this go on any longer. The once peaceful town we called home had become a place of fear and nightmares, the forest surrounding it now inhabited by deadly, unknown creatures. We had come together as a group of hunters, determined to protect our town and families from the mysterious predators responsible for the gruesome animal attacks that had plagued our community for months. We had entered the forest, weapons in hand, prepared to face whatever horrors awaited us. But we were not ready for the cunning intelligence and ferocity of the creatures that hunted us. They picked us off one by one, their stealth and speed unmatched by any predator we had ever encountered. I was the last survivor, my friends and fellow hunters, now nothing more than memories and fallen comrades. Desperate and terrified, I stumbled deeper into the forest, hoping to find a way to stop these relentless monsters. That's when I discovered it an ancient relic hidden away in a dark, forgotten cavern. 
Its mysterious power seemed to resonate with the creatures, hinting at the possibility of controlling them. With newfound determination, I began to study the relic, learning its secrets and unlocking its potential. As I deciphered its ancient symbols and harnessed its power, I devised a plan to turn the creatures against one another, using their own instincts and abilities to defeat them. With the relic in hand, I ventured back into the heart of the forest, seeking out the lair of the predators. When I found them, I used the relic's power to emit high-frequency sound waves, carefully tuned to a frequency that specifically affected their hearing, leaving the other forest animals unharmed. The creatures, disoriented and incapacitated by the sound, began to turn on one another, their pack mentality shattered by the unbearable noise. As the predators fought amongst themselves, I watched from a safe distance, the power of the relic protecting me from their wrath. The once fearsome creatures were now vulnerable and confused, their reign of terror coming to an end. With the last of the creatures defeated, I returned to the town, battered and bruised but alive. I carried with me the relic, a testament to the power it held and the lives it had saved. The nightmare was over, and our small town could finally begin to heal from the horror that had gripped it for so long. In the end, the ancient relic and the knowledge of the high-frequency sound waves had been the key to our salvation, allowing me to overcome the deadly predators and protect the home and people I held dear. I didn't personally witness any of the sightings, but I heard about them from the police reports. Officer Linda Seabrook saw a creature that looked gargoyle-like while driving home from work on the Garden State Parkway around 7.04 p.m. She couldn't believe what she was seeing, but was sure of the dark reddish skin and scaly reptilian wings of the creature. Another police officer, Scott Kimball, had a sighting of a gargoyle-like reptilian on Route 33 near Union at approximately 4.35 a.m. He saw a creature nearly six feet tall with scaly wings protruding from its back. The creature had larger than normal eyes and canine teeth. Officer Kimball saw the creature land briefly on an abandoned building and was able to make out its approximately five foot long tail. Police dispatch also received calls about sightings of a gargoyle-like creature in Cherry Hill Township at around 8.43 p.m. Witnesses reported seeing a creature nearly seven feet tall with large bat-like wings behind its shoulders. The wingspan was estimated to be around 13 feet across. There were also reports of strange flying reptilian creatures in Pensacon Township at around 317 a.m. Multiple witnesses called the PD to report creatures with red glowing eyes, large wings, and massive black talons. While I haven't seen any of these creatures myself, the reports are certainly intriguing. I've always loved exploring the great outdoors, and one of my favorite pastimes is hiking the trails in the Mount Hood National Forest. The vast expanse of wilderness, filled with towering trees and hidden mysteries, calls to me like a siren song. One crisp autumn day, I set out on a solo hike down Old Cat Road, a trail that meanders through a replanted area of the forest near Colton. As I walked along the path, my senses were filled with the sights, sounds, and smells of the forest. The rustle of leaves beneath my feet, the chirping of birds high above, and the earthy scent of damp soil filled the air. The beauty of the forest never failed to take my breath away. It was then that I stumbled upon something that would change the course of my hike and spark a deep curiosity within me. As I rounded a bend in the trail, I noticed a set of tracks leading out of the replanted area onto the road. The tracks were unlike any I had seen before large, deep impressions with distinct claw marks. Curiosity peaked, I decided to follow the tracks to see where they led. They continued along the road for a short distance before disappearing back into the trees. I hesitated for a moment, unsure if I should venture off the trail, but my curiosity won out. I stepped off the path and followed the tracks into the dense forest. The underbrush grew thicker as I pushed deeper into the trees, and the tracks became more challenging to follow. Still, I pressed on, determined to uncover the mystery of these unusual tracks. As I continued my pursuit, the forest seemed to close in around me, the shadows growing darker and more oppressive. 
Finally, after what felt like hours of searching, I found the source of the tracks. In a small clearing, I came face to face with a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was massive, standing at least eight feet tall, with dark, shaggy fur and piercing, intelligent eyes. I realized with a mixture of awe and terror that I had discovered a cryptid, a creature of legend. The beast regarded me with curiosity, as if it were just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. We stood there for a moment, locked in a silent standoff, before the creature turned and disappeared back into the forest, leaving me alone in the clearing. As I made my way back to the trail, my mind raced with questions. What was this creature? How had it managed to remain hidden for so long? And most importantly, what would I do with this incredible discovery? From that day forward, my life was forever changed. The encounter in the forest fueled a lifelong passion for cryptozoology and a quest to unravel the mysteries of the unknown. The memory of that fateful day in the Mount Hood National Forest continues to inspire me as I journey through the world of cryptids, searching for answers and unlocking the secrets of the wild. Alright, so this takes place a little over a year ago in the north woods of Wisconsin in winter. My parents had been out of town for probably about a week, and I was dog-sitting. I was in a big old house alone, which I didn't mind too much. I couldn't drive, but I'd take long, cold, winter walks through the woods a few miles to get to the grocery store. I say this to point out that I knew the place pretty well and definitely wasn't scared of the area. On one of the last days they'd be gone, I heard a strong, distinct whistle. It was at the same tempo of the sound a foghorn would make but very high-pitched. It was pretty loud and sounded incredibly close. I looked out the window and saw nothing and no one. I also heard about nothing, no footsteps, birds, deer, or anything else. The silence was so eerie that I could feel my heart pounding. I immediately ran to shut and lock all of the doors and windows. I stayed up about half of the night with the most unsettling feeling I just couldn't shake, like when you know that something's watching you. I also want to mention that my closest neighbors were completely out of town, and I saw no footsteps the next morning except my own. I grew up in Hillsboro, just down the road, and there was something that haunted me during those years, a tall, featureless figure darker than the darkest night. It appeared in my room on multiple occasions, always in a different position. Sometimes it would be crouched down in the corner, facing the wall, while other times it would lurk inside my closet, staring into its depths. These encounters left me feeling unsettled and frightened. One particular night, shortly before I was about to leave for college, the figure took on a more terrifying form. As I awoke from my sleep, I saw it bent over at a perfect 90-degree angle, its face positioned directly above mine. It started repeating the same phrase over and over again in a haunting voice, I am here, I am here. The words echoed through the room, sending shivers down my spine. That night marked the last time I ever saw the figure. As I left for college, I hoped to leave behind the unsettling experiences of my childhood. However, the memory of that encounter remains deeply ingrained in my mind. It's both fascinating and unsettling to hear someone from the same area recounting a similar experience. To this day, I find myself reflecting on those encounters and wondering about the true nature of that mysterious figure. What was it? What did it want? The questions remain unanswered, and the memory of those eerie encounters continues to leave an indelible mark on my consciousness. It's a reminder that there are inexplicable forces in this world that we may never fully understand. I was born and raised and currently live in the very rural Northwoods of Wisconsin, near the UP border of Michigan on land that was originally, and still somewhat sparsely populated by the Ojibwe people. I had a similar experience this past February 2023 that I can't shake. I was solo snowshoeing an isolated trail system in the Chequangan Nicolet National Forest in the Lake Superior Snowbelt, not far from my home. It's a beautifully remote place that I've explored many times alone, often never crossing paths with another person. This time it was sunny late afternoon. 
I was again alone on a particularly scenic trail, paralleling a small, fast-flowing river which was open and only iced over on the banks, enjoying the serene scene accompanied by the sweet songs of chickadees and industrious sounds of nuthatches amplified by the cold calm. As I got further on the trail, I noticed it suddenly got very quiet, which wasn't alarming at first as the winter woods can get very silent, especially considering our high snowfall amounts that blanket the land. Then, out of nowhere, I heard a rhythmic, deep, and reedy sound of a low, but loud whistle through the brittle woods. I was captivated as I had never heard that sound before. It had a powerful pulse to it that I can't really describe. I am an avid birder, admittedly, not an expert, but I was baffled. The noise was somewhat close when I first noticed it, but instead of being curious, I became concerned as I heard the sound getting closer to me. The sound inexplicably filled me with dread. It seemed to be traveling quickly, maybe as fast as a bounding deer, and seemed physically low the utterance coming from somewhere just above the ground and well below the treetops. While I was out there, I rationalized that the strange vocalization must be from a raven. Ravens are year-round residents up north, so I am very familiar with them. They are highly intelligent birds with complex, individualized calls that include deep sounds like croaks. However, I have never ever in my four decades of living up here have ever heard a raven utter a sound like that noise. That day I was deep in the woods and was the first person breaking trail after a big snow, so I couldn't move fast. I decided that my best course of action was to just keep going until I got to a switchback that would shorten my journey. As I paralleled the river from a ridge above dense with new pine growth, I heard the sound from what seemed to be between me and the river, maybe 50 yards maximum. I stopped and listened as it moved on and beyond, still paralleling the river. I couldn't see much ahead of me, and I did not hear any footfall of it breaking the snow. Honestly, as irrational as I felt, I was grateful to be hidden. I hauled it to the trailhead and got out of there as fast as I could. As soon as I got home, I started researching and seeking out any information on what bird or animal could have created that vocalization. Nothing I found matched that sound. To this day, I just tell myself it must have been a raven, but I know in my own small understanding of the world that it was something else. My grandma used to tell me one of her little brothers was always kidnapped by dwarfs. She said she never saw them, but her brother often spoke of them, and how naked little kids were always calling and waving at him, asking to join them. Eventually, some other adult got involved and told my grandmother's grandma to make the boy poop in the middle of the front yard, which is where he allegedly always saw them. Apparently dwarfs love cleanliness and are easily disgusted, and it worked because he never saw them again. I'm from Panama, by the way and my grandmother used to live in Darien, where her family has a big finca. This would have happened in the late 30s. Anyway, when I was in elementary school, my school was in the middle of this. I don't know how to say it, but it was a decent neighborhood, except behind it there was a stream and a fair amount of flora and fauna. A small woods, if you will. I swear I saw them playing near the stream naked. I never saw them call to me at all, but I do remember distinctly seeing them several times in a space of a week. My parents told me I was just seeing things, but I think my friends saw them too, because I remember we would all avoid going to the area where you could see through the gate to where the stream was. I've spent tons of my life in the forests and scrublands of Washington, including some very minimalistic backcountry long distance hikes and these are the only truly unnerving things that happened. The first was maybe 2010. Hiking on the Colonel Bob Trail, and it was fairly empty because it was a rainy day and the trail was partially washed out at the time. We only saw one other person the whole time, a man we first passed resting against a rock, carrying a rifle. My friend started chatting to him and asked if he was hunting, and he said no, he was actually out training for an upcoming hunting event. After this, we passed him repeatedly without ever seeing him pass us, and without him saying a word to us. Often he was just crouched in the bushes off the trail, watching us go by. 
I get that he was just a very skilled stalker who could move quietly off the trail beside us, but even though I know this was just his hobby that had nothing to do with us, it sort of felt like we were the targets of the stalking and made me uneasy. The second, I think it was 2019, was weirder. We'd been camping for a few nights, just sleeping in the van in spots around the National Forest, having a great time. Moonlight, full sky of stars, owls and insects, the whole experience. We hadn't seen any other people in the forest itself, but it was very lively and safe feeling. On the third night, we were fairly deep and somewhere southeast of Quinault, and the atmosphere was completely different. There were a ton of fires going in Washington and Oregon, so the air had gotten really thick with smoke, then fog had rolled in off the Pacific, and the two together completely absorbed all noise and light. There was no wind at all, no rustling of trees, and not a glimmer of light. With the headlights of the van, visibility was maybe two feet, but with them off, it was space mountain levels of darkness, like you could not see your own hand an inch from your face. I opened the van door to get out and piss before sleeping, but decided against it. The air was seriously just so thick, still, and dark that it made all my hairs stand on end. Plus, we'd parked on a road with steep switchbacks, so I was a little bit worried I'd walk off a cliff. Since neither of us were risking going outside, we went straight to bed. As we were drifting off, there was suddenly pounding on the middle side window, right above where I was lying, and on the side facing the trees rather than the road. It sounded like an angry person banging on it with the side of their fist. We both went dead silent and still, then my friend roared. What? In a comically deep voice. No answer, but maybe ten seconds later we heard a slow tap, tap, scrape on the side of the van. My friend had lived in this van in Seattle for five years and had had plenty of people actually trying to break in and basically just shooed them away. But in that moment he said F this, and we got into our seats, got our seatbelts on, and left. Like maybe there was someone camped nearby, but they definitely weren't behind us, or to the right or left of us. And the worst part is that it was a gravel forestry access road, with gravel on both sides of the car, on the most oppressively silent night I've ever experienced, and we didn't hear a single footstep. I think the absence of footsteps is actually what gave both of us the sense of urgency, because it did not not feel like this was a drunk grouse hunter trying to pull a prank. I used to night hike with friends during high school and go off into wilderness around North Bend, Fall City, and Preston. Sometimes in the rain at 2 a.m. I did one time have an encounter with something deer-looking and tall asp in the middle of the night at the top of the Issaquah Highlands also ran into my first bear encounter there lol. Whatever it was, it was peering out of the bushes near the only street light on a road that goes into the wealthiest homes there. I was just taking a stroll admiring the architecture. It literally looked like a deer. I could only see its head and neck. It made no sound when I saw it come out. We made eye contact and I was about 15-20 feet away. Only thing was this thing was literally 7 feet tall. In the first two seconds I saw it, I was stunned and cautious. It then suddenly tilted its neck 90 degrees, and I ran so fast back to my car that shit freaked me out. But it happened so suddenly I don't talk about it much. It's not a credible story for me. Other than that I had one ghost experience as a child. Shit is ingrained in my memory. I can never rule out the supernatural because of that experience. Guess I've had three poltergeist events too, but again, I don't find them compelling enough, just unexplainable. I was with some friends screwing around in the mountains above Spokane during hunting season. We were driving up a dirt road when we saw some lights on the hillside above us, maybe 300 yards away over a creek and up a hillside. It was dark enough, and we were in a canyon that the sides looked pitch black, except for three red lights. I thought it was hunters with headlamps set to rid to keep their night vision, but they were acting kind of funny. They seemed to be hopping up and down every so often, even playing leapfrog. They never disappeared behind each other and moved pretty quickly at times. We ended up outside of the truck watching them and trying to see through the binoculars. They went out in the middle of the hill 
and we watched a minute longer with nothing happening. At that point, my buddy got out his massive spotlight. We lit up the hillside, everything looked normal, but where the lights were was a rocky cliff face with sheer drops and overhangs. We decided to head back at that point and started driving back down. Took a wrong turn and ended up on an impassable road by truck that led to the top of a ridgeline. My friend starts backing out when the entire forest lights up with an intense blue-white light. We all look up out the windows expecting to see a helicopter or something, but none of us can actually pinpoint the source. My buddy stops on the gas in reverse. We go flying and right when we break out onto the main road, the light shuts off. It was far too bright to be a spotlight. Being near a ridgeline, I had a decent view, and it seemed like a large area of the forest was lit up like a movie set. We booked it down the mountain, and it became a running joke that we scared some fae, so they decided to scare us lol. I've been back and seen the rock face in the daytime, but for the life of me I cannot find the other road we pulled onto. I remember it looking really defined when we pulled onto it though, and not even questioning if it was the right way. It's important to the story to know that I was basically a huge jerk leading up to what happened. See, I'm a graduate student and I was at this point about 6-8 months into a new relationship with a woman named Sarah. If it matters, I am female, and we were both around 30 at this time. The prior year before I met Sarah, my best bud from school Josh, and I had gone on a great camping road trip over spring break. This year, I messed up and basically double-booked myself to go camping with Josh and with my girlfriend, because I am a scatterbrained idiot, and I got confused about what plans had been discussed, solidified. Both Josh and Sarah were justifiably really pissed off and hurt, but I had made the plan with my girlfriend first, ultimately, so I had to flake on Josh. When it came time to planning, Sarah and I picked a campground in southwestern Pennsylvania with lots of good hiking. It's at least a five-hour drive from where we live. We made reservations and I mentioned the plan to Josh. Well, it turns out, of all the campgrounds in the region, Josh had also decided to head to that one as it connected to a long bike trail he wanted to go on. He had decided to go camping alone. So we knew Josh would be at the campground before we got there. But things were super awkward between me and him on account of my being an asshole and him being generally a bit depressed around that time. We stayed three nights and Josh was there for the first and second night. We'd rented out a small cabin, basically a prefab shed with bunk beds, because it was cheap and we have a leash reactive wimpy about rain dog, and it's sometimes easier that way. Josh was tent camping in another spot. I think Josh and I were mostly planning on avoiding each other, he was rightfully still angry, Things were awkward, and I figured he needed some space from me. But it turned out only one bathroom was open on our side of the campground. Since it was only early April, and most of the campground was still closed down for the season. Josh's campsite was right next to the open bathroom, so we ended up seeing him when we walked to the bathroom at night. I saw heard signs of one or two other groups on the far side of the campground, but they had their own bathroom open over there, and we never really saw them. It's a very large and forested campground, and only small sections at either end were open for the season. The second night, Josh was out in his campsite when we came through to the bathroom before bed. It was after midnight at this point. Josh seemed super depressed, and we had a very strange and awkward conversation with him, took care of what we needed to in the bathroom, and headed back to our little shed down the road. The roads in this part of the campground were basically like an inverted F, with the bathroom above the top of the F. In between the two arms of the F was a stand of trees next to the main road, a small, locked shower building and Josh's campsite, furthest from the main road, the main road being the vertical line of the F. We were staying off the main road further down on the opposite side, so that night we'd cut past Josh's camp to get to the bathroom, but on the way back, we followed the road, so as not to bother him, as he seemed in a bad mood. It was dark and I'm easily spooked. We had the dog with us, which was somewhat reassuring, since he looks semi-tough despite being a nutcase and a wimp. But I'm looking around nervously, and as I glance over my shoulder, I think I see a man off to the side of us. 
My brain processes this very slowly, as I just caught a glimpse of him as I turned my head, and it was very dark. I convinced myself my mind was playing tricks. I didn't look back and silently walked with Sarah and the dog back to our cabin. When we got back to the cabin, I thought Sarah looked a little spooked, which is unusual, since she's a lot braver than me. Eventually, she says, that guy was really creepy, right? So shit. He was real. I told her I saw him, but had convinced myself my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no, we both saw someone with no flashlight standing in the trees just off the road, maybe 15 feet from us. I asked if it might have been Josh. Neither of us were really convinced, but wanted to convince ourselves so we could get some sleep. And he had been wandering around being moody 15 minutes before, and it was right by his campsite. I think we didn't want to freak ourselves out any further, so we locked the cabin and didn't talk about it much more. The next morning it was pouring rain so Josh decided to pack up and leave early instead of spending the day in the area. We shouted goodbye to him as we headed to the bathroom, and he ran around tossing shit in his trunk and trying not to get drenched. That night was a weekend, and there was a big family in the cabin next to ours and everything felt far less spooky. But when we got back to town a day later, I texted Josh, asking him if he'd been lurking creepily in the woods. He said no. Well, I told him what we'd seen, and he said he'd seen a guy the prior night lurking in the woods without a flashlight. Same general description, which I'll get to, same area. The guy had really creeped him out, so much so that the next day he bought the biggest mag light he could find, so he'd have more than just a pocket knife to defend himself but he'd also mostly convinced himself it was a park ranger. Yeah, with no flashlight, let alone a vehicle. But he more or less willed himself to believe it, so he could get some sleep. So, once we could no longer pretend it was Josh, Sarah and I compared notes. What we both saw and what Josh saw the night before was this. A tall, gaunt white man in his late forties, with clean-shaven sunken cheeks in the stand of trees, brambled just off the road, and the space between the arms of the F. He was wearing a raincoat, rubber boots and a hat, and had no flashlight. He was just standing still and staring coldly in our direction. I remember his raincoat, his sunken face and how very cold his gaze felt. In contrast, Josh is several inches shorter than whoever we saw, was not wearing a raincoat that night which we knew because we'd just seen him, but we convinced ourselves otherwise bearded, 29 years old at the time. I should add, it wasn't raining. To be clear, where this guy was was not somewhere you'd be strolling through, it was a thick, brambly area. He had made the effort to move out of the road and to stay in the shadows and away from the bright bathroom light, both nights. We're sure he wasn't going to the bathroom, though we were on the women's side. You can hear the men's side clearly, and Josh had been outside in view of the bathroom doors both nights. He didn't look like he lived in the woods, which is to say, he appeared clean and groomed, and his clothes weren't worn or dirty. Whatever he may have been doing in the middle of the night, in a nearly abandoned campground with no flashlight, he was clearly making an effort not to be seen. We all discussed it and Josh ultimately called the campground to let them know. They said they'd check it out. Although my camping fees were mysteriously refunded, we never heard anything more. Josh is still a little mad at me for seeing a potential murderer lurking the woods near his tent and not doing anything. Out of curiosity, we just checked to see if anything had happened in the park. A number of people have gone missing in the state park over the years, some slightly mysteriously. Most were found downriver and believed to have fallen into the rapids on accident. I'm sure it's unrelated, but the whole place gives me the creeps. And I still can't figure out what that man was doing. I remember back in high school, my religion teacher shared some jaw-dropping stories with us. He claimed to have worked as an assistant to the local exorcist, involved in intense spiritual battles against the forces of darkness. It was an unexpected twist in our religious education, but it certainly grabbed our attention. He recounted encounters where he had direct conversations with the devil himself. These exchanges were chilling and unsettling, as he described the cunning and manipulative nature of the fallen angel. The things he heard during those interactions would send shivers down our spines. 
but it didn't stop there. My teacher went on to describe the physical manifestations that accompanied these exorcisms. He spoke of furniture being violently thrown across the room, as if an invisible force was wreaking havoc. The intensity of these encounters was like something out of a horror movie. What intrigued us even more was the revelation that most of the people who required exorcism were practitioners of Satanism. It seemed that their involvement in dark rituals and worshipping the devil had invited malevolent entities into their lives. As unsettling as it was to hear, it reinforced the importance of spiritual discernment and the need for protection against evil influences. Those stories stayed with me long after high school. They challenged my beliefs and made me question the existence of supernatural forces. While I couldn't fully comprehend or verify the authenticity of my teacher's experiences, they served as a reminder of the constant struggle between good and evil that transcends the boundaries of our physical world. Whether or not one believes in the paranormal, these stories opened up discussions and expanded our understanding of faith, spirituality, and the power of belief. It was a unique and unforgettable chapter in my high school experience where the lines between reality and the supernatural blurred, leaving us with more questions than answers. This happened nine years ago in the early spring when I was 15 years old, spring 2014. I was at a friend's house in corn country about an hour north of Indianapolis. Nowadays, I am very familiar with the paranormal unexplained having multiple shared experiences with friends but at the time I was a major skeptic. I didn't fully process what we saw until years later. I came over to my friend's house to hang out like any other time. I brought my pellet gun, he had one as well, so we could shoot some moles on his farm property. After a while, his brother joined us, and we eventually got bored of looking for moles. There was a patch of woods about the size of two football fields a little over a mile away completely surrounded by empty cornfields with no access points from the nearby road. The three of us decided to walk out there because why not? We were bored kids looking for fun. We put on some boots and headed out with our pellet guns. The walk wasn't super far, but it took us a while to reach the woods because all the spring rain from earlier in the week made the empty field a big mud pit so muddy your foot disappears with each step. Then right as we walked through the brush surrounding the edge of the woods, we saw it. The best way I can describe this thing is it was a raccoon that was built like a Great Dane. We had seen coyotes and wolves before, and this was not that. It 100% looked like the biggest raccoon we had ever seen. We could tell we caught it off guard because it was just standing there on all fours grooming itself and then it immediately locked eyes with us when one of us pointed at it and said, look at that thing. There were a couple of seconds where we just looked at it as it looked back at us before it quickly turned around and scaled a 60 feet tree. We lost sight of it in the canopy. We then looked at each other and were like, WTF was that? We talked about how the way it climbed the tree was what freaked us out the most. It only took a few strides up the tree using its front two paws to grab a spot on the tree to lift and launch itself up the tree. The arms were freakishly long and lanky looking when it climbed. It honestly looked somewhat human in the way it articulated its arms as it climbed, like its elbows jutted out to the sides as it pulled itself up. We talked about how freaky that was some more and decided to keep looking around, because even though we were spooked, it was intriguing, and we wanted to see if there was any other freaky stuff around. There definitely was. The woods were littered with easily over 100 animal carcasses, bone piles. Most of them were cows, raccoons, and opossums. There was one spot maybe 25 by 25 feet that had at least a dozen cow carcasses ranging from just the bone left to one that looked less than a week old. They were definitely being eaten by something with huge chunks of flesh missing. I know cows get loose all the time, but damn if this didn't look like a feeding spot. My theory is this thing was stealing cows from local farms for food. There are a couple within five miles. We also found a man-made small pond near the middle of the woods, which couldn't have been more than six feet wide. A shovel and plastic bucket was sitting next to it. Once we found that we're pretty freaked out again and decided we better head back because we had less than two hours of daylight left, 
and there was a lot of thick, deep mud to slowly walk through to get back. That's pretty much it. At the time, it freaked me out a bit, but looking back now, knowing what skinwalkers are, I'm just happy we came back completely unscathed. Unfortunately, I don't hang out with those guys anymore and I tried to go back with some different friends somewhat recently only to see that the woods had been cleared out and there was nothing there. I thought I was tripping out, but I looked on Google Earth and I could see in its place was dirt and log piles. Probably an omen to not chase this thing. I'll take it at face value. I haven't heard of the dogman, but this thing didn't look like a dog, coyote at all. I just used Great Dane as a size comparison as it was freakishly large to be looking like a raccoon. Yes, it had a striped tail like a raccoon. It had the face of a raccoon, specifically the large black spots around its eyes. Stubby almost rounded ears like a raccoon. It had bushy fur like a raccoon. We saw it very clearly with no obstructions from about 30-40 feet away. It was early spring and the brush inside the canopy was still dead. I used to hunt in Leon County at my family's old homestead that has been around since the late 1800s. The frame house that my grandmother was born in is still standing. It was built in 1920, I believe, and I would drive in from College Waco and spend the night while hunting down there. We were always scared to be alone in that house just because of all the old furniture and pictures, etc. I fell asleep on the couch one night when a norther was blowing through. I remember awaking briefly thinking it had gotten cold, but fell right back to sleep. In the morning when I woke up, I had an old quilt draped over me. This was not a quilt that would have just been draped over the couch. In fact, my mother confirmed later that she had that quilt put up in a closet. It sounds crazy, but I have no other explanation. I had no recollection of ever getting up. I'm a believer in guardian angles, and that is all I can sum this experience up to. Needless to say, it was several years before I stomached up the nerve to sleep alone in that house again. My mom, dad, and cousin each have a story that take place on the same patch of road in Mexico. I'll tell them as they were relayed to me individually. My parents actually met here in the United States, but they grew up in neighboring pueblos in Mexico. Connecting the two pueblos is a long, empty span of road, maybe five miles long, which is apparently haunted. These stories take place many years apart, but on the exact same patch of road. When my dad was a young man, he loved horses, jaripios, and drinking. While he has since put down the bottle, he still loves horses and jaripios lol. But back in the day, he would occasionally ride his horse out across the road to the neighboring Pueblo to hang out or hit up some parties. One early morning, he was returning home on horseback from a party in the neighboring Pueblo. He was a bit drunk and was just casually making his way home when suddenly the air grew still and the night went silent. He said something just felt off and his horse could sense it as well. My dad says that you can always tell what a horse is focusing on by looking at their ears, and in this case my dad's horse's ears were perked up stiff and focusing at the empty field beside them as well as all around them. Thinking that there might be some sort of animal stalking them, my dad looked around but the fields beside them were empty and there weren't any bushes or things for an animal to hide behind. Suddenly the air went cold and my dad felt goosebumps on the back of his neck, almost as if something was right behind him. That's when my dad's horse couldn't take it anymore and took off running for its life. My dad held on tightly and tried several times to bring the horse to a stop, but it was dead set on getting the hell away from whatever they had just encountered. Eventually, they finally reached their pueblo and the horse calmed down and came to stop. Never before or after had the horse behaved that way, and it left my dad shook up. Needless to say, he was sober by the time he reached home. So I quit my job as a park ranger a few days ago, not because I got tired of it, it's because I've seen some crazy shit. I wasn't one of those park rangers that stand around or sit in a shack. I was the kind that were bound to towers, taking radio calls and more. So it was a normal day just sitting, 
looking out for any strange things. You may be asking, strange things? When I first got the job, they informed me of strange entities and happenings. Those I still do not know to this day. As day started setting, I got a radio call from the other tower. Yes, I had the night shift that day. The man at the tower, or Chris, told me he's heading home and just a reminder to look out because night isn't pretty. As I see his lights turn off of the tower, I knew that my shift started. Nothing really happens when you work the night shift, but this specific day was strange. I was sitting next to the park map they left us when I hear static coming from the radio. I knew someone was trying to contact the tower, so I walked over. Before I had time to respond, a scared, out-of-breath man was on the radio. Hello, I heard. I did the standard procedure. This is Tower 4. What seems to be the problem? Finally, someone helped, the man said in relief. I was on the trail when I heard something behind me. Any more information? I asked him. Yeah, I started to speed up when I did it. It sounded like something was running after me. Stay on the line, I said. I opened the instruction manual. I was reading the part about hikers being chased by an animal. As I was reading, I heard a scream over the radio. Hello? Do you copy? Help? Whatever was chasing me is still chasing me. Keep running, but where are you? The lake that's near Tower 2. Head to the nearest tower. We always leave the towers open because when the shifts are over, they require to unplug and put the radio in the locked box. Yeah, that's dumb, but it's how it works. As I return to the radio, I hear a scream from the radio and outside. It sounded like somebody was getting murdered. Hello, where are you? I hear on the radio. I lied for my safety. I'm at the tower I sent you to. Okay, he sounded so calm. I pulled up my binoculars and zoomed in on tower. What I saw scares the shit out of me. It was a creature looking at me with red glowing eyes. It was waving at me. I was frozen in a state of paralysis just being watched by this creature. It was weird. It almost looked like something out of a movie or a game. As I started to feel like I could move again, I used it to grab the hunting rifle given to me. I aimed, but nothing was there anymore. I sat down and got the flask I hid in my drawer, and I took one sip. Then I heard the familiar creak of my tower steps. It was late and no one comes to check up on me at this time. I hid under the bed provided. Who's there? The thing said. It sounded like my boss, but I knew it wasn't. It sounded like a somewhat good impression. I knew it wasn't him when I saw its legs. It had hooves and fur, and I only saw its bottom part. It left, but whatever was there could replicate voices. Whatever it was, I don't know, but that was the one part that almost made me quit but there are many more reasons. Okay, so I live in Australia. I wasn't sure where to post this, but someone on another page recommended to post this here. It's currently autumn and I live on the outskirts of a major city still in the suburbs. This happened yesterday in late afternoon when I went to hang some washing on the line under our carport attached to side of house. We were starting to lose daylight, so thought I'd quickly pop out and hang up the last of the washing for the day. It was increasingly getting darker by the minute. I had just begun hanging clothes when I started to get an uneasy feeling. I'm unsure why. I brushed it off as it I was losing daylight quickly. A minute later, I heard a group of kids up the other end of the street screaming, and then silence. Again, I brushed it off as the kids just being kids and playing with each other. The intensity of unease grew and I felt like I was being watched. I then heard a low growl which was unlike anything I'd ever heard and the air got significantly colder and all the crickets and bugs went silent. I moved the clothes rack to outside the carport so I could use what little light there was to hurry this up as much as possible. Which hanging and scanning around between picking up the next piece of clothing I noticed something new. Though this dense garden that wrapped around our U-shaped drive looked poor like it had been trampled in a decent section, maybe 13 feet of the garden, 
I intensely felt I was really being watched by something and right before finishing the clothes, the feeling started to ease off a little and it began to warm back up like it was when I initially came outside. I was raised with big dogs, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, etc. and grew up in rural countryside. I've heard all kinds of animal sounds from wild dogs, foxes, koalas fighting, possums and bats. I have never in my life heard a growl like this before, and I don't know how to explain it, but it did not sound natural. It sounded closest to a dog, but something about it was very wrong. Before going outside, my indoor cat desperately wanted outside. Once I came inside, she was acting completely different, skulking around and all fur puffed up. She then was following me at my ankles around the house, not normal for her. We have a lot of bushland surrounding us and live next to a river behind us. I don't fish in that river anymore as I've always felt like someone was around. For the past few months, something has been harassing this entire house. It only happens at night, it's only been seen twice, and it's only been towards women and anyone under 18 my best friend's little brother looks like a grown man, but he's 16 if that's important. When I saw it it was sunset, but it wasn't really an animal. It was someone really tall somewhere between 6 feet 6 5. It was standing in the woods kind of far away, really pale like someone had never been in the sun, blonde hair, black shirt, I couldn't see the pants and its face wasn't visible. It was looking straight down. The arms were really long too. I was about to leave and I thought it was a person. So I said they weren't allowed on our property. It's a rental if that's important. It just spun around and took off, never lifting its head. It was really fast like it almost disappeared fast. When my best friend's mom saw it, she described the same thing, but with jeans and said it was closer to six feet, six feet seven. It was in the same area that I saw it. This time it was sunrise. Ever since then, any time I've had to go outside at night, I go pick my best friend up at midnight five times a week from work. If I say anything, it mimics me. Sometimes its voice matches mine. Sometimes it sounds like a woman. Sometimes it sounds like a man. Sometimes I can't tell. It's all coming from the same area I saw that thing. My best friend's sister keeps having the same thing happen to her all in the same spot in the woods. We all aside from the three men in the house keep hearing animal noises, but they don't really sound like animals. I saw a shadow outside of my window last week, and my best friend's little brother keeps having someone tap his window at night. The windows are on the opposite side of the house from where we keep hearing and seeing everything, and the little brother's window is close to 15 feet off the ground. The shadow I saw went above my window almost five feet off the ground and three feet tall, and it was almost a combination of a human and a deer, like it was a hunched over person with something sticking out of its head, and it had a snout. Last night when I was leaving late night Walmart run, I walked outside and something screamed and started crying. I yelled for my best friend and ran back in while it was mimicking me. Nobody else heard it, and it stopped when he went outside. I made sure not to say anything when I went outside last night, but it still happened, so it's definitely watching us. I don't think we've done anything to upset anyone, and none of us are natives unless you count the several generations back everyone in my area has. But I don't because none of us ever actually live like Native Americans, but we do live about a 20-minute drive from what used to be a home to Mississippian Indians. I'm sorry if that's not the proper name. It was turned into a museum that is now run by their descendants. I live in Alabama, about a four-hour drive from Mississippi and Tennessee. Is this a skinwalker, or is it something else? I just want to get rid of whatever this is. The dogs won't go out at night, and normally I can sense energies, but I can't anymore. It's really freaking me out. It's daytime, so I'm not concerned right now, and it's never hurt us either. Just whatever information I can be given would be helpful right now. Update. Kinda, not really. I took some advice someone mentioned and tried to keep quiet and not react in any way the last few days. It went well until today. I was walking my son to the car just now and he said hi to something in the woods. Not once, not twice, but three times. He waved the last time. It did not respond. 
but I about shit my pants because that means he can see whatever it is. When I was about 15 or 16, I was walking my uncle's dog. His name was Zeus, and he was an American bulldog and loved me and all his family, obviously. So one night I'm taking him to little dog park they had on the military base we were stationed at in Germany. We were walking on this path through like a courtyard of these four buildings. As I was looking ahead, I thought I saw somebody under the street light, but I didn't pay it any attention. I was like maybe 100 or so feet away, I'm not sure. As we got closer, Zeus slowed down and what I thought I saw before at this point looked like it was seven feet tall, but could have also been taken as like a shadow, it was weird. I started walking to it. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't tripping or going crazy seeing things. At this point, I'm like pulling Zeus to walk with me and see what's going on. The closer we got, the shadow thing started taking form. By the time we were like 30 to 25 feet, I saw like a 10 feet hooded figure, and you couldn't see a face or anything in the hood. It was like a void. Zeus started barking, which he never does, and I was like frozen for a second and dropped the leash, and he took off running. I snapped out of it and took off running too, and nothing happened to us. About eight years later, I saw it again while out in Atlanta one night. The night that changed everything for me began like any other night. I was visiting my grandparents and sleeping in my grandmother's bed, as I always did. However, something strange and frightening happened that I couldn't explain. I woke up in the middle of the night, feeling a strange tickling sensation on the back of my neck. I tried to swat away whatever was bothering me, but the feeling persisted. That's when I turned around and saw it. A pale, human hand with long, sharp, black nails. It was attached to a figure wearing a monk's robe, and everything beyond the hand was just an unnatural blackness. As I watched, the hand reached out and touched me, and a voice whispered in a calm, but dark tone, Follow me. Where we will go, it is beautiful. Despite feeling scared, I somehow remained calm and replied, No, I don't want to. But the figure was persistent, and it responded with a more forceful voice, Believe me, you want to come with me. That's when I screamed and turned to my grandmother, who was dazed and claimed that I was dreaming. But the encounters didn't stop there. On another occasion, I was in bed, and my mom had just left the room with the lights still on. When I turned back to the door, I saw a figure made of pure blackness with bright green glowing eyes. I called out to my grandmother, but there was no answer. I turned away and back, but the figure was still there. And then suddenly it was gone. It wasn't until 12 years later that I would hear a similar story from my stepfather. He told me that he had been up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom when a shadowy figure with glowing green eyes had touched him. He even had a red handprint on his shoulder as proof. He had no knowledge of my experiences, which made it all the more eerie. To this day, I still don't know what I encountered or why. But I do know that those experiences left an indelible mark on me, and I will never forget them. This happened when I was younger, probably around eight, after I had experienced what I know now as a near-death experience. I was with my grandmother who was still very healthy for a 76-year-old woman. We went trekking across our rural property with a picnic basket in tow, just looking to sit down with our dog and have a nice time. Normal grandparent stuff. We ended up crossing the creek. It was dry at the time to go to the back pasture. Nearby, probably 50 yards away, was our cedar tree. We sat down and started eating when our dog started acting crazy. This dog, bless her soul, was an angel. Did not act like a dog most of the time. She never barked, never jumped, and always acted politely. She went nuts, running in circles around us, growling and barking. My grandmother got concerned, so she put our picnic stuff back in the basket and tried to calm her down. I was sitting a few feet away, scared because my dog was growling. I will admit my memory gets fuzzy around here but I remember seeing a large gray creature step out of the creek tree line we had previously walked through. My grandma scooped me up and booked it out of there, our dog running with us. 
I am 90% sure she ran to the cedar tree. She always talks about it being her favorite tree and about how protective it is. The tree was a lot closer than her house, which was roughly a half mile away at this point. I just know our dog calmed down and I was happier. No, I don't live in the Southwest. I live in the South Central Aston, Arkansas, close to Louisiana. So I have no idea what it could be. I was driving out in the country in a back road town of Willis, Michigan. Then something quite startling ran in front of my car. It literally was running so fast, not only was it a two-footed seven, nine-foot blur. It was weird how its legs literally went from the foot back to a joint, like an ankle, then forwards like a joint like our knee. Then it went back to the hip. It made it go so fast, almost literally went in front of my back road, cruising 25, 35 miles per hour. I watched, but as fast as it was, I made its full body out. Its head had pointy like upward ears, like a Doberman pincher almost. Then its body was like a person, except the shoulders were strong, like a very built man. Its head had remained to point straight ahead like our heads do. But its body was longer because of how tall it was. It has been running like a blurry werewolf. And since it was a full moon, I thought werewolf. But it was running so fast because it had a different shape than the people. I wish I could draw. I will never forget what it looked like. It went in front of my car running into a small back road cemetery. It had to have been a werewolf. I'm not sure what it really was, but as soon as I saw it, my first instinct was to pray and go to the nearest church as fast as possible. So I did. While saying the Lord's Prayer, I trembled and my body was in fear of the unknown. I stayed at a church and slept in the parking lot the entire night. I thought that would be crazy if werewolves had been truly, really, actually physically real. But I went back later to find out the cemetery was called the Child's Cemetery, and the name was from the Child's family. Most of the tombs had been children of the Masonic Templars, for the symbols all had distinct characteristic traits. And the actual percentage of the graves had actually been from children. All had died between 1927-1932. I don't know what it was from. Smallpox, maybe. But that was the first, but not the last time. I was with this girl crazy. I thought she was for talking to herself. But we saw two of them running in a field a week later. I thought of shapeshifters and things of nature. I don't know what made it come to mind. But whatever the case, it was scary. My spouse and I were riding in our private sleeping compartment on the train from Chicago to Portland, a trip we took almost every year to visit our relatives. I was keeping a close eye on the clock, as the train had left with a delay and had to make numerous unscheduled stops to let other trains pass. We both honestly admitted that we were nearly naked during the journey. In the afternoon, around 2 p.m., the train made an unscheduled control stop about 10 minutes west of the Dalles, Oregon. Glancing diagonally across a snow-covered clearing between the train and the Columbia River, we spotted a dark Sasquatch stepping into the clearing, accompanied by several dark birds of an unidentified species. The Sasquatch hunkered down to look at the train, occasionally getting up to walk a few steps before crouching down again. The hair on its legs stuck out on the surface of the snow, like bell-bottom pants. When hunkering down, its arms were outside its knees, and it rose without any assistance from its arms or hands. My spouse and I felt secure within the train, and were not seen by the Sasquatch due to the tinted windows. We could exchange mutual questions during the eight-minute period that the train stopped, verifying our mutual impressions of the creature's reality and appearance. The contrasty lighting made it difficult to see the animal's features in detail. The conductor indirectly admitted to seeing it too, but the terrain's geometry prevented others in compartments ahead or behind ours from viewing it. We couldn't alert others during the event because of our state of undress. The train left with a Sasquatch still watching. We both stated our absolute conviction that what we saw was a Sasquatch. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. 
You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food, so it doesn't feel threatened anymore and attacks a human. They all know it wasn't a bear, though. Bears don't leave wounds like that, and they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself. Now I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer. Anyway, that's partially why I'm posting this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird happening in the woods, but this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forests. Growls, yipping, even human-sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises, and even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman, and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight in his backpack, inside a small cave near the location of his body, a couple of days after he didn't return, and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden, other than that the truth seemed so messed up and unreal. I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything I'm going to read to you he had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011, Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22, 2011, morning of day two, quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night, one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No lights, so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be. Last October 22, 2011, night of day two. Stop for the night in the valley, cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. Dead tired, and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. 
I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011, night of day two, second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try and block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance cracked, covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside, clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway, not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall, and possibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier, when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing, and suddenly everything went silent. No voices, no hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet, knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me up right against the tree, and I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life and I didn't look back but knew it wasn't far behind me. About twenty feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside, I could hear it shuffling around trying to get into the crack, and I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again, I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range, but after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks more specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged seventy feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there, his arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found. Those scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing have been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of humans sending voices coming from the woods. And we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. They are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was, broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. My name is John, a seasoned park ranger assigned to mentor a rookie named Ethan on his first assignment. We ventured deep into the remote backcountry of the vast national park, eager to pass on my knowledge and experience. 
Little did I know, our routine patrol would quickly become a harrowing fight for survival. We stumbled upon a series of gruesome animal killings that defied any logical explanation. The carcasses were left in a manner that suggested no known predator was responsible. As we investigated further, we discovered the existence of a pack of supernatural predators that could blend into the shadows, moving silently and unseen. These creatures were unlike anything we'd ever encountered, and their mere presence sent a chill down our spines. Ethan and I knew we had to overcome our fears and rely on our skills to outwit these elusive predators. Our priority was to alert the public to the danger lurking within the park's borders, but we knew we needed to act fast. We devised a plan to lure the creatures into a trap, using our knowledge of the terrain and animal behavior to our advantage. Unfortunately, our plan did not go as smoothly as we had hoped. As we managed to ensnare the predators in our carefully laid traps, Ethan became separated from me. I heard him cry out, and my heart sank as I realized that my young protege had fallen victim to the creatures we were trying to stop. Despite the pain and guilt that weighed heavily upon me, I pressed on, capturing the remaining predators. As I stood there, mourning the loss of Ethan, a government helicopter suddenly arrived. Before I could react, a group of armed agents emerged and locked me in, taking the captured predators with them. I demanded answers, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. The helicopter took off, leaving me with a sinking feeling that I would never learn the truth about the creatures or the government's involvement. After that day, no one ever saw or heard from me again. My disappearance became one of the many mysteries that haunted the park, a chilling reminder of the unknown dangers lurking in the shadows. Two years ago, I found myself on an elk hunting trip with three of my buddies. We had set up camp near Ukiah, Oregon, or at least that's what I think it was. The days were spent scouting for elk, and the evenings were filled with laughter, storytelling, and of course, drinking screwdrivers around the campfire. One particular night, as we sat around the fire, we were all in high spirits, sharing our adventures from the day. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a loud, undulating scream echoed through the forest, cutting through our laughter and chilling us to the bone. It was unlike anything any of us had ever heard before, and it sent a wave of fear through the camp. Instinctively, we all jumped up and ran for our guns, our hearts pounding in our chests. The adrenaline coursed through our veins as we frantically scanned the dark woods surrounding the camp, trying to pinpoint the source of the terrifying sound. As we stood there, weapons at the ready, we caught a glimpse of a large, shadowy figure moving swiftly through the trees. The sheer size and speed of the creature was enough to make us believe that it was a Sasquatch, a creature we had all heard stories about, but never truly believed in until that moment. Just as quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the darkness, leaving us all standing there, dumbfounded and shaken. We gathered around the campfire once again, our previous mirth replaced by a sense of unease. We spent the rest of the night discussing the incident, trying to rationalize what we had experienced. Over time, the memory of that night has faded, but the feeling of fear and awe that the scream evoked still lingers. We've shared our story with others, some of whom believe us, while others dismiss it as a product of our overactive imaginations and too many screwdrivers. Me, my uncle, and my cousins went to the site to hunt deer. We lined up six abreast on the far side of the trench to push any deer out. As we walked along, I inadvertently got forced down into the trench. I then kept with the direction of the trench. After a short time, I smelled something. It smelled like some stinking animal. Then I heard it running back and forth as if frantically looking for something. I could tell by the sound it was two-legged. I could feel the ground shake like when a herd of elk gets spooked. At this point, I hear a tree maybe six to ten inches on the stump come crashing to the ground behind me. At this point, I made extreme haste for the walls of the trench. Pulling on vines, I made my way out and straight for our vehicles. I did not linger at the trench for further investigation. From all of my experience in the woods, I can with full confidence say what I encountered was not a bear and was definitely two-legged.
crisp autumn air filled me with excitement as my four friends and I gathered around a roaring campfire outside the hunter's lodge. This remote cabin was nestled deep within the heart of a dense forest, and it held a century-old history cloaked in mystery. We had rented it for a week of hunting and relaxation, but we had no inkling that our decision to spend a week at this secluded outpost would lead to a terrifying encounter with the unknown. The group consisted of James, Sarah, Mike, Lisa, and myself, Daniel. We had been planning this trip for months, eagerly anticipating the chance to escape the hustle and bustle of city life and trade our smartphones for rifles and hiking boots. The lodge, despite its eerie past, offered the perfect escape from the daily grind. As the days went by, we settled into the lodge, swapping stories by the fire and savoring the simple pleasures of life away from civilization. However, as night descended upon us, an unsettling feeling began to creep over our group. The wind whispered through the trees in an eerie, ghostly chorus, and the old lodge creaked and groaned as if it harbored its own secrets. On the third night, we were jolted awake by a faint, mournful howling in the distance. It was unlike any animal we had ever encountered, sending shivers down our spines and making sleep impossible. We tried to dismiss it as a trick of the wind and attempted to resume our slumber. The following evening, as we gathered around the fireplace, we heard something that chilled us to the bone, a low, guttural growl emanating from just beyond the lodge's walls. James, known for his fearlessness, grabbed a flashlight and cautiously peered out the window. My blood turned to ice as I watched him shine the light into the darkness. There, right outside the window, was a beast. I could see spittle running down its face, and its eyes were fixed on James. It stood on its hind legs, its fur a matted blend of cream, red, and brown. Its face was wolf-like, with a snout and sharp teeth, but apart from that snout, its facial features were eerily human. Its jawbones were high, and the structure around its eyes and the eyes themselves were shockingly human-esque. Its eyes, I believed, were a chilling shade of yellow. James stumbled back from the window, his heart pounding, and relayed what he had seen to us. Panic began to set in as we huddled together, wondering what kind of creature could lurk just outside our lodge. Our questions remained unanswered, and we were overwhelmed by a sense of dread. The night grew colder, and the growling continued. Then, a more terrifying sound reached our ears, the scratching of claws at the door. The creature was trying to get inside, and fear quickly turned to desperation as we realized we were trapped. That's when Daniel, the most level-headed among us, proposed a dangerous plan. He suggested that we escape through the back door and set explosives inside the cabin. The idea was to lure the creature inside and then detonate the explosives from a safe distance. It was a risky plan, but we had no other choice. With trembling hands, we prepared for our escape. We cautiously opened the back door and crept out all while hearing the front door splintering under the creature's assault. Panic set in as we sprinted into the woods, barely escaping the pursuing horror. Taking cover behind the trees, we watched in terror as the creature entered the cabin. Lisa, tears streaming down her face, clicked the remote detonator, and the explosion lit up the night sky. The cabin erupted in flames, and the force of the blast sent shockwaves through the forest. When the smoke cleared, there was no sign of the creature. The lodge had been reduced to smoldering ruins. Our ordeal was over, but the fear and the memory of those piercing yellow eyes would haunt us for the rest of our lives. As we made our way back to civilization, we vowed never to speak of the horrors we had encountered. To this day, we maintain that it was a true story, a tale of terror that unfolded in the dark depths of the wilderness a story of a remote hunting lodge with a history best left buried in the past. The very first time I went deer hunting was back in 2015. In West Kentucky and went on my then-girlfriend current wife's family land on the opening day of rifle season. I got put in one of their stands on the edge of a swamp that was only about 100 yards in the woods with soybean field out front. The stand faces into the woods and about 300 feet from the stand turns into public TV ground. The TV ground is accessible, but you'd have to either trespass or walk through about two miles of thick swamp to get back to where we were. 
I get dropped off to the stand and remember taking in the 25 degree pitch black morning and waiting in the dark for things to lighten up. Then I see a blue light walking through the woods. As it got closer, I see an old man with a white beard wearing red and black flannel and a stormy cromer walking down the trail that leads to and past this stand with an old school lantern held out at arm's length. He walked past my stand, never looked up at me and walked onto the TV and disappeared. I got a doe that morning and never have figured out where that guy came from. I was there until about 12.30 or so and never saw him walk back out either. This is a story I heard a few years ago from my flatmate at the time. I won't be able to elaborate on details, but will try to recall from my memory as best as I can. Happened in Hungary. P.S. English is not mine, nor his first language so sorry, if there are discrepancies in government institutions or anything else. His dad was a hunter, so took him hunting quite a lot. And if memory serves me right, dad was employed by something like National Guard, so not someone who's easily scared. Anyway, this one night they are out flatmate around 10 at the time and camped in the meadow near forest. Early autumn, so not too cold. At some point while having dinner, they heard rustling in the nearby woods. Not surprising a lot of wildlife around. Can't recall the in-between, but eventually they went to investigate. They spotted a wild boar and dad was about to take a shot when something large rose up on their right. It was dark, so they could not see much but they were also too close to the thing, around 300 meters max. Grass was not too tall, so it appeared that it was either crouching without moving or laying, but once it rose, it was clearly walking on two feet, but it wasn't not a human. Dark fur, clearly canine features and glowing eyes. It looked them over and just walked away. They were frozen in place and my flatmate said he'd never been so scared in his life. They took off running, jumped into the car and drove away. His dad had another sighting of something similar while on patrol, but I don't remember that story well and unfortunately haven't bumped into the guy since. Story fascinated me, but I also remember that while telling this he was scared and guarded. This is not much at all, but hope someone finds this interesting. Believe it or not, I had a close encounter with what I can only describe as a leprechaun when I was a kid. I was out in the pasture, just enjoying a leisurely day, playing around and soaking in the peacefulness of the setting sun. As it began to set, I decided it was time to head back home. As I started up the hill towards the house, something caught my eye. There was a small leprechaun-like being sitting on the ground. I squinted, trying to make out the details in the dimming light, but it was undeniable there was a little man just sitting there on the ground. I stood there frozen, simply staring at him. My mind was racing, trying to comprehend what my eyes were seeing. I was caught in this strange limbo between disbelief and fear, when suddenly my survival instincts kicked in. I turned and sprinted back to the house faster than I ever had before. The following day, curiosity got the better of me, and I ventured back out to the spot where I had seen the peculiar figure. Sure enough, the grass was all flattened where the little man had been sitting, a silent testimony to the previous day's encounter. I have to clarify that his clothes weren't the stereotypical bright green you'd associate with leprechauns. However, using the term, leprechaun was the easiest way to describe the being I saw. He was a small figure, sporting a beard and earth-toned clothes, and even had a small, pointy hat. That encounter remains one of the most surreal experiences of my life. I never anticipated that my quiet job as a park ranger would thrust me into the heart of an enigma that chilled me to the bone. My responsibilities mainly revolved around maintaining the trails and keeping a watchful eye on the wilderness through the trail cameras scattered across the park. Little did I know, those cameras would become the gateway to a mystery that would consume my thoughts and haunt my dreams. It all started on a routine day. I was in the monitoring room, sipping on lukewarm coffee and watching the live feed from the trail cameras. 
The usual scenes of wildlife and hikers played out on the screens until one particular camera caught my attention. The footage showed an eerie figure standing at the edge of the trail, its form barely distinguishable in the shadows. I dismissed it at first, thinking it might be a trick of the light or a hiker dressed oddly. However, as I continued my surveillance, more unsettling images began to appear. Figures that seemed to emerge from the trees, their faces obscured, engaged in peculiar rituals and movements that sent shivers down my spine. It wasn't long before I realized that something was deeply amiss within the boundaries of the park. Determined to unravel the mystery, I delved into the archives of the trail camera footage. The further back I went, the stranger the occurrences became. Whispers of forgotten stories echoed through the visual spectral forms, inexplicable lights, and peculiar symbols etched into the bark of ancient trees. Late one night, fueled by curiosity and a growing sense of unease, I decided to venture into the park myself. Armed with a flashlight and a map, I followed the trails indicated by the camera's footage. The air was thick with an otherworldly tension as I navigated through the darkness, guided by the dim glow of my flashlight. As I neared a clearing that the cameras had captured repeatedly, an old, dilapidated structure emerged from the shadows. The remains of what seemed to be an abandoned cabin stood before me, barely visible under the veil of night. As I cautiously approached, the creaking of the floorboards beneath my boots resonated through the eerie silence. Inside, I discovered remnants of a forgotten era tattered furniture, decaying wallpaper, and the lingering scent of decay. A dusty journal lay on a wooden table, its pages filled with cryptic entries detailing a local legend about a group of settlers who had vanished mysteriously centuries ago. The more I read, the more the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. The figures in the trail camera footage, the strange rituals they all seemed to tie back to this long-forgotten story. It spoke of a curse that befell the settlers, an ancient ritual gone awry, and a presence that lingered in the woods, seeking redemption or revenge. Armed with this newfound knowledge, I realized that the park held a dark secret, hidden in plain sight. The figures in the footage were not anomalies but echoes of the past, trapped in a perpetual loop. As a park ranger, it became my responsibility to uncover the truth and bring closure to the restless spirits that wandered the trails. In the days that followed, I worked tirelessly to piece together the forgotten narrative, consulting local historians and delving into historical records. With the information I gathered, I reached out to paranormal experts who specialized in cleansing rituals and spirit communication. Together, we embarked on a journey to free the park from the haunting specters of its past. The night of the ritual was tense, as we stood in the clearing where the mysterious figures had once congregated. The air seemed to crackle with energy as incantations echoed through the woods. Gradually, the figures from the trail camera footage materialized before us, their ghostly forms flickering in and out of existence. As the ritual unfolded, a profound stillness settled over the clearing, and the figures began to dissipate into the night. The air felt lighter, and a sense of peace replaced the previous unease. The forgotten story that had lingered for centuries was finally put to rest, and the park exhaled a collective sigh of relief. In the aftermath, the trail cameras captured nothing but the ordinary beauty of nature, the rustle of leaves, the graceful movement of deer, and the gentle flow of the river. The unsettling figures that had haunted the screens were gone, leaving behind a park that felt rejuvenated, as if it had shed the weight of centuries of unresolved history. As a park ranger, I continued my duties with a newfound appreciation for the delicate balance between the present and the past. The forgotten story had become a chapter in the park's history, a reminder that sometimes the most unsettling mysteries are the echoes of stories long left untold. I had always loved the peace and tranquility of living on my five-acre property, surrounded by cow fields on all sides. My dogs were my only companions, and we had developed our own little routines, including singing silly songs together. One of the songs I often sang was the nursery rhyme, Daisy, Daisy. It had become something of a tradition for me to sing this song to my pups as they wandered around our home, mostly indoors since they were indoor dogs. On a crisp fall evening, 
I found myself alone in the house with the windows wide open, enjoying the cool breeze that swept through. As I hummed the familiar tune of Daisy, Daisy to myself, I suddenly heard something that made my blood run cold. A faint, low whistle echoed through the air, mimicking the tune of Daisy, Daisy with eerie precision. The whistling was slow and deliberate, as if someone or something was taunting me. At the end of the verse, the whistling ceased, leaving an unsettling silence in its wake. Fear gripped my heart, and I couldn't bring myself to look outside to investigate the source of the haunting sound. I closed the windows, my heart pounding in my chest, and tried to shake off the unsettling feeling that had settled over me. To this day, I still don't know what caused that chilling whistle. The memory of that eerie night remains with me, a constant reminder that sometimes, the unknown can be far more terrifying than anything we can imagine. I've woken up a few times in the middle of the night for no reason with my heart racing. There's no feeling of dread though. Prior to this, I was being woken up by something actually making noises to wake me up. The first time was when I was sleeping, and I started hearing something tapping on my metal bed frame. I woke up but hadn't opened my eyes or moved yet, and I heard what sounded like a coin or something metal tapping my bed frame on what I think was the leg closest to my head to the left of the bed. It went something like tap, 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 pause, tap, 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 tap. It was definitely not rhythmic and like it was intentional. Something was trying to wake me up. I sat up in bed and it stopped. Another night I heard something tapping on my glass vanity table like it picked something up from my table and started tapping. As soon as I moved, it stopped. This was actually my childhood home that I moved back into with my family and my parents moved to the house next door. It was never haunted as a child. I had just moved into this house from a house next door that my parents owned and that house was haunted. Did it follow me to the house next door? I don't know. But one night after the fifth time of waking up for no reason and my heart racing, I did something this might sound odd, but this is what I experienced. I don't know why I did this, but I imagined I had a bright, white light of protection in my center that grew around me. I imagined it getting bigger and bigger and pushing anything entity away. I think I made this protection field expand and encompass my house. When I did this, I felt such peace. The feeling I felt was indescribable. I felt light, warm, peaceful, not scared, and drifted off to sleep in a couple minutes, whereas before when I would wake up like this, it would take me hours to calm down and go back to sleep. If somebody would have told me this story of the protective white light, I would most likely be skeptical because I've never heard of it. I googled protective white light, and it's actually a thing. I don't know what made me do that, but it helped. By the way, this is just a small portion of what's happened to me. When I lived in the other house, a whole lot of stuff happened. I have a chilling story to tell you. It all starts back in the 1986 or 1987 Pennsylvania bow season. I've been after a big buck all season, maybe a 185-190 class buck. Walking the creek bottom for some time in the hemlocks, and it was getting dark in them, so I made it to a clearing about half a mile. I saw a few deer and a couple small bucks, not what I was looking for. I was walking back to my truck, next to a farm, and I had a feeling that something wasn't right, so I turned around and I thought, there's a bear there about eight yards from me. I was standing along a cornfield, and it was in the cut oats field I had the wind in my face. That's when I knew something was in the field. The animal stood up and started to walk toward me. It was about 35 or 40 yards from me now. I said out loud, do not make me use this bow. It stopped, turned around and walked away from me. It looked like a large logger and it walked in the cut oats field, then in the tall field of corn. I did not let the grass grow under my feet. The next day I went back to the spot where he was in the cutouts. I could not walk in the tracks and where it enters the core was nine feet tall, so that made him eight feet tall and smaller than the corn. P.S. When I got home, my wife said I was white as a cloud and my eyes were as big as a plate.
I am from Waterville, Maine. Back in the late summer or early fall of 1971, I was newly married and living in Killeen, Texas with my husband who was in the U.S. Army. We had a small duplex apartment in Killeen. One night he had duty and I was home alone in bed around 3 a.m. in the morning. I woke up suddenly and saw a black figure standing at the bottom of my bed. It was eight or nine feet tall and had huge big black wings and red eyes. I closed my eyes and opened them again, and it had moved closer to me on the right side of my bed. I couldn't scream. It was as if I was frozen in fear. I covered my head in the blankets. I was so afraid. About five minutes later I looked and it was gone. It gave me a horrible feeling and I prayed never to see it again. Shortly after this event, I came back to Maine as I was way too frightened to ever stay alone at night when he was on duty. I told my mom I had seen a huge black angel that night, and she was glad I came home as that didn't sound good. I had never heard of the Mothman, but a few years later I came across an article and a drawing of one. Even before I read the article I said, wow, that is exactly what I saw in Texas. It didn't have a noticeable neck and its face was hooded. Its wings tucked in on its side, but you could tell they were very large. It was totally black except the eyes were round, large, and red. I still think of this thing with fear. Personally, do you have any idea what it is? I'm 57 now and I am still searching for an answer. P.S. The apartment I lived in had a well in the entranceway that always gave me the creeps. A cistern, I believe it is called. Just a flat rock covered it, and it still had water in it. I couldn't see the water, but I heard the plop when I dropped a rock in it. This probably has nothing to do with any of this, but felt I should tell you anyways. In the summer of 1999, my cousin and I decided to embark on an exciting adventure near Timothy Lake, Oregon. Both of us had always been fascinated by nature, and we were eager to explore the backside of the lake and look for any signs of wildlife. Armed with nothing but a .22 rifle for protection, we ventured off the main trail and began our exploration. Our main focus was to find bear signs which had been reported in the area. As we delved deeper into the forest, we stumbled upon a log that appeared to have been torn apart. This was exactly the kind of evidence we were hoping to find. As we examined the area further, however, we discovered something even more intriguing, a series of human-like tracks stretching for about 50 feet. What caught our attention was the enormous stride between each step nearly eight feet apart. We couldn't believe what we were seeing and started to wonder if these tracks could be the work of a Sasquatch, a creature we had heard stories about but never truly believed existed. Unsure of what to make of our discovery, we decided to head back to camp and share our findings with our uncle. As an experienced outdoorsman, we believed he might be able to shed some light on the mysterious tracks. To our surprise, he was just as intrigued as we were and agreed to come and take a look for himself. Upon examining the tracks, our uncle couldn't hide his astonishment. He too began to entertain the idea that a Sasquatch might be responsible for the footprints. The thought that we could have stumbled upon evidence of such a legendary creature left us all feeling a mix of excitement and fear. Over the years, our encounter near Timothy Lake has remained a topic of conversation within our family. The mysterious tracks continue to pique our curiosity, and we can't help but wonder if we had indeed crossed paths with a Sasquatch that day. While we may never know for sure, the experience taught us that the natural world still holds many secrets, waiting to be discovered by those daring enough to explore its depths. To give you an idea of why I was out in the middle of the woods at midnight, I run cross-country collegiately. This means that I'm supposed to run every single day 10 miles a day, and I can be particularly lazy about this. When you've been doing it for seven years, it gets old quick. So more often than not, my roommate and myself will put off our run until late because we struggle to find the strength during the rest of the day. Well, it turns out that we picked the wrong night to be lazy. As 11 p.m. starts to roll around, I told my roommate Matt that we need to get our miles out of the way. He agreed and we both lace up, 
grabbed our flashlights and left our dorm. We live on a decent-sized campus with a lot of woods on the back of it and a full-size golf course, so we decided to run on the trails out there. At night it is pitch black and can be hard to see the path even with flashlights, but it breaks the monotony of running the same routes and we happen to like the adrenaline of being creeped out. So we began our run and started heading towards the woods. Instead of taking the normal trail that leads right through the middle of the golf course, we elected to take a different entrance and eventually we realized we were lost. It was still possible to see the clock tower on campus from where we were at so we knew we just had to head in that direction to get home. I wasn't too sure of how to get there from the course path, so we just stopped our run and walked directly through the woods and trees until we ended up on another green of the course that I have never been to before. While we were trying to get our bearings, I noticed a flickering light in the distance. I asked Matt if he saw it also, and he just nodded as we both stared. Slowly but surely, this light got closer and closer. It wasn't long until we realized it was another flashlight from someone on the trail. As I watched the light bob up and down, I began to comprehend what this meant. We weren't alone out here. That didn't make any sense though. It's almost midnight. Why would someone be five miles into the middle of the golf course at this time? Why are they alone? What could they possibly be doing? We were sure it wasn't maintenance because the maintenance building shuts down at 5 p.m. and they wear bright green to give notice to golfers' safety reasons. Soon enough, the silhouette of a tall man came into view and the distance between us and him was only brought down to 50 feet or so. He stopped dead in his tracks and we just continued to stare. This really only lasted a minute, but it felt like forever. The man did not seem phased by us and started walking towards us but then made a quick turn to the right, which was where the green ended and the woods began uphill at that. Right before he entered the woods, he turned back to face us. As he did this, he shined his flashlight up at our faces, the kind of way you do to blind someone, and all we heard was the massive footsteps of this guy sprinting and the heaving of his breath. With that very moment, we took off. Let me tell you, I have never ran that fast in my entire life even being a collegiate runner. We ran and ran and never looked back until we made it to the street that our campus begins on. I don't know what that man wanted or why he was in the woods so late, but he clearly intended harm to us. This isn't our first weird occurrence in the woods at school, so I may post more soon. One day my best friend and I were taking a shortcut to her house. It goes past a few houses and through a small area of woods, crossing a two feet wide creek. This particular day, I was wearing one of those jackets that had earbuds as the strings a must have item as a fifth grader in 201,011. As we were passing one of the houses, a couple big dogs come running from it, jumping on us and obviously just wanting to play petted. The owner of the house comes out and I noticed right away that he was acting really fidgety and nervous saying stuff about the dogs like, oh, it's okay, they're nice, don't worry. We made small talk with him about the dogs for a few minutes and turned around to leave. About or minute or so later, we arrived at the small creek when I noticed that one of the rubber earbuds that was on my jacket was gone, and I insisted on going back to look for it. The guy came back out again and offered to help us. He asked what the material was made of, and I said it was made of rubber. We made small talk again, I think about the jacket and how cool it was. Anyway, he said he was going to be right back with his metal detector. He walked away towards his shed and I said to my friend, Why does he need a metal detector? The earbud is made of rubber. Next thing you know, he's coming back with, I shit you not, a rifle, and he's literally running towards us. When I'm telling you we ran, we ran. When we got to safety, past the creek and near her house, I was telling her we needed to call 911. She insisted that we not do that because her parents would be mad at her. I explained to her with urgency why it's important we called the cops, but she refused and I couldn't force her. I didn't call because I didn't want to do it alone, plus it would have been my first time calling them. I can't remember when if I told my parents that night what happened, but when I told them, they gaslit me and said I was crazy overreacting, that I didn't really see that. 
I still think about this dam near every day and it haunts me. The second time was again in fifth grade, taking place after the first story, but I'm not sure how long after. The friend from the previous story lived near a cemetery, about a five minute walk from her house. It was a big cemetery and we liked to walk around it a lot. Plus behind the cemetery was a shortcut through the woods to a big park, which was coincidentally right next to our school. This day we were also with another good friend of ours. We were just walking around the cemetery this day when all of a sudden, a blue truck pulls up next to us in the row, next to where we were walking about 10 feet away or so, not far. I could see two guys were in it literally just staring at us and I again got that weird feeling I got with the first guy. This is hard to explain but right before the shortcut in the woods is a fence with a cutout that leads to a field of grass and a hill next to it that leads into the neighborhood of where my other friend lived. The hill was really a bunch of dead grass, weeds, sticks, cattle, etc. Anyway, I told my friends I had a bad feeling about these guys, that they were staring at us and quite literally slowly following us with the truck. We booked it to that grass field and through that hill. I had all sorts of cuts and gashes from all the shit that we were running through. When we got to the top of the hill, we turned around and the truck was parked at the top of the hill on the other side, with both men outside of it holding guns rifles. I truly believe they were coming after us, and they were visibly mad that we got away from them. I knew they were after us because they have had to have driven through the cutout in the fence, amongst the gut feelings and just the entire situation. We ran to my friend's house, noticed her parents who truly didn't seem too worried, and drove my other friend and me home. I don't even remember if I told my parents about this time since they gaslit me when I told them about the last time. I just can't shake the fact that this shit really happened when I was in fifth grade, 1011 years old. I also can't believe how lightly my parents took the situation. I'm honestly traumatized about what happened and I think about it a lot. I just needed to tell some people what happened, but I have trouble getting my thoughts into words. It was the winter of 2020. I was driving north on Highway 21 at approximately 10.10 10 p.m., just outside of Hillsboro, Missouri, just past Jefferson College. I was just passing the northbound off-ramp from Hayden Road onto northbound Highway 21 at mile marker 169.6. I'm not sure of the day of the week. I work the night shift every weekday and also work the same shift every other weekend, so all of the nights just seemed to run together. I just remember it was very cold and the road was deserted. I was the only car in the north or southbound lanes for as far as I could see. This is the same route I have taken to work every night for the past eight plus years, so I know the road very well. The dash of my car showed the ambient temperature is only 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but standing outside it felt even colder. It was clear, with no wind, rain, or snow. It was a clear, bitterly cold night. Just before mile marker 169.6, I noticed a rather tall, thin guy standing on the right-hand shoulder of the road under the streetlight. He stood facing me as I headed north. I slowed as I came upon him out of caution, but was not dumb enough to come to a complete stop. He was standing completely still, not walking or moving at all. I have seen other people walking along the side of this highway at night from time to time before so I did not think too much about seeing someone this night other than the fact that this night was so bitterly cold. As I approached, he stood completely motionless. He was very poorly dressed for the cold. He was wearing only a dark color faded hoodie and dark colored faded pants of some sort. I cannot remember if they were jeans or sweatpants. They had no holes or rips in them, but I remember that his whole appearance looked rather shabby. He had his head covered with the hoodie and kept his head pointed down enough so that I could not see his face. I could not see any sign of breath being exhaled into the bitterly cold night air from under his hoodie. This was really creepy. He stood there, completely motionless with his hands hanging to his sides. I remember thinking to myself that if I were out in this kind of cold that was poorly dressed, I would certainly keep myself moving to try to stay warm. 
But this guy was standing completely motionless, not walking, not swinging his arms or moving his hands or fingers or legs at all. He stood completely still, like a statue. Another very odd thing was that he wore no gloves, so his fingers had to be freezing. He did not have either of his hands in his hoodie pocket or his pant pockets for warmth. The hoodie seemed to fit his frame proportionally well, except the sleeves were too short. His arms were way too long for the sleeves. I could see maybe three 3.5 inches of the bare forearm from the bottom of his hoodie cuff to the top of his hand, which looked odd. Everything else seemed to fit okay, but his arms were way too long for the sleeves. This guy was tall. Compared to the mile marker sign which was behind him, I would say that he had to stand six foot nine inches tall or more. As I slowly drove past him and watched him, it became one of those moments when time seemed to slow down. It was as if it all happened in slow motion. I can remember a lot of detail and how he just continued to stand there in the cold completely motionless as I drove past him, never turning his head or moving any part of his body in any way. After I passed him I could still see him in my rear view mirror standing there on the shoulder of the highway, in the same spot, illuminated by the street light above. He still remained there completely motionless, like a statue, not moving at all, his hands still hanging at his sides his body completely motionless, not even a finger moved. I kept glancing into my rear view mirror to take another look at him until I rounded the corner and finally lost sight of him. I never saw him move the entire time. I got this rather ominous dark foreboding feeling as I passed him. If what I saw were some kind of ghost or demon or specter or whatever you want to call it, it certainly was not ghostly in appearance at all and looked as solid and as real as you or me. I still do not know what it is that I saw that night, but I hope I never see it again. It really freaked me out. I was about 16 years old at home alone for the night. I fell asleep just fine, but I woke up later at around 3. I couldn't fall back asleep, and then I started hearing this weird high-pitched ring in my ears. It kept getting louder, and then out of nowhere my door starts creaking open. It's the loudest door on earth, and I hear really slow dragging footsteps walking into my room. I turned to see if anyone was there, and the doorway is completely empty, and I heard the footsteps start moving towards my bed with the ringing in my ears getting louder. I flipped out and rolled over facing away from the footsteps, feeling pretty helpless. I thought it went away when I heard the stepping stop until I felt something sit on my bed. I honestly have never prayed harder in my life. Eventually it just kind of stopped all at once, and I just laid there wide awake for the rest of the night. I told my mom about it a day later, and she said that she used to hear the same dragging footsteps too. I changed rooms away from the basement after that. When I was around eight years old, my family, and I lived in this old house that always gave me the creeps, especially this one room that was kept as our study. Every time I'd walk in or pass this room, I just felt yucky and had the most intense feeling that I was being watched by someone that hated me being in there. Anyways, fast forward a few months and my father decided that he was going to make the study room mine as I was sharing a room with my younger brother. I begged him to give it to my younger brother instead, I was the eldest so I should get to pick. It ended up being my room. First night in this room ended up being my last. This part I remember like it was literally yesterday. My dad came in and said good night and proceeded to turn off my bedroom light. As soon as he left the room I felt that intense foreboding feeling I had had every other time I had been in this room. Except that this time I was different. It was like I could feel a set of eyes on me. I pulled my blankets up over me as I was that scared. After about 30 seconds, the blankets started being pulled down and left me staring into my room with no apparent reason or cause. I looked around quickly and then pulled the blankets back over my head and again. Blankets started to be pulled off me. By this stage, I was scared out of my wits. I remember telling myself that it was probably just my cat playing around but I looked under my bed and around the room and my cat was not in my room. I then told myself that I'm going to pull the blankets back up over my head, 
But if something starts to pull off my blankets, then I'm out of here, no matter what my father says. I pulled the blankets back over my head slowly, whilst looking around the room for anything that could be doing this to me. After another 30 seconds, my blankets began to be pulled off me, and this time I booked it out of my room so fast it was unreal. By this stage I was in tears of fear and my dad couldn't console or convince me to go back into that room. This all is 100% true, and I remember it like it happened a week ago, when it was in fact well over 20 years ago. Also my brother and I had reoccurring night terrors in this house. Someone broke into the house and they broke in by smashing the window to the study room. The room that was foreboding and haunted they however cut themselves so severely on the window of the study room that they left empty handed. There was loads of blood all over the window and side of the house where they had tried to crawl in through the smashed window and into the study room. That room was just wrong. My family lived in Vermont for several years in a small town called Northfield, south of Montpelier. There's a local legend in Northfield of a thing known as the Pigman. The story has multiple versions, as most do, but some parts are always the same. Back in 1951, the night before Halloween, this 17-year-old kid named Sam Harris went out on his own with a basket of eggs to cause some mischief. Nobody knows exactly what happened to him, just that he never came home and was never found. Years later, some high school kids were out drinking behind the school one night during a dance when this thing came walking out of the woods on two human legs. It was naked, covered in white hair, and was wearing a hollowed-out pig's head like some grotesque mask. Naturally, the kids tore out of there and went and told people. Word spread and some farmer admitted he'd seen a figure matching that description digging through his garbage one night. Some pigs had also gone missing recently. More sightings were made of the pigmen, as it became known, but many times the claims were just kids wanting to get attention. Now, whether this thing is Sam Harris or this thing ate Sam Harris, nobody in town knows for sure. But what they do know is that it isn't afraid of people, and it really likes to eat meat. There's a place just outside of Northfield known as the Devil's Washbowl, with a river and waterfalls and several caves. After more sightings of the pigmen were made out by the washbowl, some people went investigating and found that one cave, in particular, was littered with animal bones, some of which were pigs. It got around that they'd found the lair of the pigmen, and it became popular for teens to go out to the devil's washbowl at night and try to catch sight of him. My sister and a couple of her friends went out to the devil's washbowl their senior year. They took sleeping bags and flashlights and all the gear you take to go camping. I wasn't there to give a first-hand account of what transpired. I was only eight at the time. I can only tell you what was told to me. There were six or eight of them, depending on who you ask, all couples. They picked several caves, one for each pair. My sister and her boyfriend were in their cave. She was rolling out their sleeping bags, and he was trying to start a fire when they heard some shouts, and then screaming from one of the other caves. When they got there, the girl was curled up in a ball in the farthest corner of the cave, and her boyfriend was nowhere to be found. She told them that the pigmen had come trudging into their cave, completely undaunted by their presence. The guy had started shouting at it, both to drive it away and to get the other's attention. The pigmen casually picked up a large rock and struck the guy in the side of the head with it, knocking him unconscious. It picked him up, slung him over its shoulder, and shambled out of the cave just moments before the rest arrived. Nobody had seen it exit the cave, nor seen signs of it at all. They did find the rock lying on the cave floor with blood on it, and bare footprints in some soft creek mud outside. The girls all drove into town and went straight to the police. The remaining boys, whether it was two or three of them, grabbed flashlights and makeshift weapons and scoured the woods around the area. The footprints disappeared at the edge of the road, and they lost the trail there. Search parties were set up. Police and canine units in a big coordinated effort, including several other adjoining townships police forces. A couple days later, some articles of the guy's clothes were found by a search dog. They had been left torn and scattered in an abandoned farmhouse a town over. The missing teen's photo was put up in the area, 
and one guy came forward. He said the other night, he'd awakened to the sound of someone lurking outside his house. He checked out his kitchen window and someone was rummaging through the trash can by his garage. The person was only wearing a faded and ripped pair of jeans. When the man hit the porch light, the intruder looked up and looked just like the kid in the photo. The only difference was that his body was covered with white hair and his eyes looked kind of hollow. The call came in on a sweltering Texas afternoon, the kind that makes the air feel heavy and the horizon shimmer with heat. I was sitting at my desk at the local police station, my boots propped up as I sipped on a lukewarm cup of coffee. The voice on the other end was tense, hurried, and it sent a shiver down my spine. It was a call I had never expected, a call that would thrust me into the heart of an enigma that defied all explanation. Some of our park rangers are dead. Something, something unknown took him out, the voice on the other end said, a tremor of fear in his words. We need your expertise, Sheriff. We need you out here in the National Forest. I knew that this was no ordinary case. With a heavy sigh, I put down my coffee and stared out the window at the blazing sun. I was a police officer, born and raised in the vast expanses of Texas, but nothing could have prepared me for what lay ahead. I agreed to head out to the National Park, where the unforgiving terrain held secrets I couldn't even begin to fathom. When I arrived at the National Park, I was met with a somber group of officers, their expressions a mix of anxiety and determination. We were issued stun guns, a peculiar choice for a law enforcement operation. The Forest Service Administration had given us a clear mandate capture, not kill. There was something out there, something that might be a new species of cryptid, and they wanted to be the first to have one detained. The gravity of the situation settled over us as we ventured into the dense forest, our footsteps muffled by the layers of leaves and underbrush. With every step, the feeling of being watched intensified, and the shadows seemed to stretch and twist in unnatural ways. I exchanged glances with the other officers, a silent understanding passing between us. We were venturing into the unknown, and none of us knew what awaited us. Hours turned into a day that felt endless, the tension mounting as the forest seemed to close in around us. And then, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the world was bathed in the eerie glow of twilight, we found ourselves standing before a clearing. In the center stood a figure, one that was both familiar and utterly alien. The creature was massive, its form stretched upward on two hind legs. Its arms were impossibly long, reaching the ground like a gorilla, but its spine was crooked, contorting its entire frame. Moonlight danced on its gray skin, and its eyes shone like twin orbs of light in the darkness. Its face was grotesque, a deformed mask that held no semblance of humanity. The officers around me raised their stun guns, and the air was filled with a crackling of electricity as we fired in unison. But the creature moved with unnatural speed, a blur of motion as it tackled officers to the ground. Panic surged through me as I fired my stun gun, the darts embedding in the creature's flesh. And then, almost miraculously, the creature fell to the ground, stunned by the sheer number of darts. We approached it cautiously, our breaths heavy in the still night air. Just as we began to bind its limbs, the forest erupted with movement, and a group of figures emerged from the shadows. They wore black, their faces obscured by masks, and their presence sent a chill down my spine. CIA operatives, no doubt about it. Step away, one of them commanded, their tone cold and commanding. This is a matter of national security. As we moved back, they pulled out a black cadaver bag, a chilling indication of their intentions. They ordered us to leave to be silent, their threats laced with an air of finality. The weight of their words hung in the air as we retreated, the forest swallowing us whole once more. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled onto something beyond our understanding, something that was meant to remain hidden. As I drove away from the National Park, I couldn't help but glance back, my mind swirling with questions and a sense of unease that would linger long after this encounter. My grandma told me this story about chanks. 
Her mom, my great-grandmother, and her brother used to go to the river to do the laundry. She used to leave the boy on a hammock while she was busy. One day, the boy began to walk into the sugar cane plantations that were next to the river. When his mom realized and dragged him out, he was saying that some kids were offering him papaya. She told him that they were alone there and there was no one else nearby. She put him on the hammock and continued doing the laundry, but the boy kept going into the cane plantation. This situation repeated many times, but the last time she realized the boy wasn't there, she ran into the plantation and found him. She scolded him, and he was swearing again that some kids were offering him papaya. When she looked up, she could see the canes moving like if three people running between them. She got scared and the left suddenly. Days after talking with other people, they told her that those kids could have been chanks that were trying to steal her kid. So she never brought him back to the river some days. When she was there alone, someone would throw her pebbles while she was distracted. I was sleeping in my studio and suddenly darted awake, fully alert, almost instinctual. A deep sense of dread and anxiety came over me as soon as I awoke, and a feeling of a presence was in my kitchen 20 feet away. It was a completely new and isolated experience. This has never happened to me. I mean, I shot up awake and felt deep dread like a draining presence. It was like a totally different sense was activated, honestly chilling. It wasn't from a nightmare. I didn't see or hear anything. I don't have depression or anxiety. Nothing that would rationalize this experience. So anyways, I'm looking at the kitchen and sensing something and feeling a level of dread and anxiety I have never ever felt in my life. So I call my dog on the bed and hug him and try to block it out. I ask him to please protect me, be my guardian, and I buried my head into him just wanting this to pass. Nothing has happened since. Until, several months later, my best friend dog sits for me lives in my studio for a week. Fast forward another couple months, and she hears my original story for the first time. She tells me while she dog sat, she had that same experience. A sudden wake up on high alert and scared, anxious and feeling something in the kitchen. I thought that was really trippy and profound, and confirms I wasn't crazy. What was it? What did it want? Did it wake me, or did my own senses protect me? Did something else protect me? It's so interesting, and I wonder if any other have had stories similar to this. By the way, my dog was chillin', thank God. I would have been even more freaked out if he sensed the presence. From my early childhood through my late teens, I lived with a trio of shadowy figures that trailed me like spectral companions. Three ethereal entities, each with its own distinct form and presence, and each tied to a specific location or time of day. The first was a woman shrouded in a cape. She was the night visitor, materializing only when I was asleep. She would stand at the foot of my bed, silent and still. Her presence was unnerving, but she never did anything more than stand there, watching me from the shadows. The sight of her was a nocturnal constant, a ghostly figure looming in the darkness of my room. The second was a childlike figure that haunted our backyard, always hiding behind the starfruit tree. This one only appeared while I was cooking in our kitchen late at night. I would glance out the window and see it there, standing still and staring at me. It was a creepy sight, a small figure illuminated by the faint moonlight, always watching, never moving. The last one was the most bizarre a man without a torso, who seemed to hover around as if gravity didn't apply to him. He wasn't bound by the rules of the other two. He would follow me in broad daylight, appearing suddenly in the most unexpected places. He was a constant reminder of this spectral trio's presence, a haunting figure that seemed to linger in my peripheral vision, no matter where I was or what time of day it was. These three figures were my constant companions for many years, a trinity of shadows that seemed inextricably tied to my existence. Their presence was unsettling, Yet over the years, I came to accept them as a part of my life. Their motives, their origins, their true nature all remain a mystery to me. But they were a part of my world, a spectral triad that shadowed my every step from childhood to adulthood.
It was the summer of June 2013, and the high temperatures were not helping farmers. Even though it wasn't a dry year in the state, a few weeks had been a little hotter than usual. I lived in Altamont, Missouri. When some of us would go water the plants at night, we noticed the strange sounds. I got a phone call from my son at two in the morning. He was very agitated. I figured something was very wrong. For two weeks, the family had been living in a state of stress and insomnia. Every other night, we'd drive to their land to water their cornfield. There were noises that we had never heard before. See, we didn't know what it was. We know there are animals out here, we know that. But this sound gave me goosebumps. It goes like a tapping sound as if somebody was chattering their teeth, only much more faster and louder, than silence, than shrieking. These aren't coyotes or wolves or anything like that. I saw something, and that is not from this land. That I'm sure. It was there standing before me as I pointed the flashlight at it. It was darn big. Then a sudden movement, fast as heck, and it was gone. I can only describe it as an eight-foot-tall winged creature with a long muzzle that resembled the face of an alligator. The animal was featherless, and its skin was gray, with a wingspan of over 80 feet that looked like the wings of a bat. The almond-shaped eyes appeared red under the stream of light pointing at them, a known characteristic of certain rodents, opossums, and birds. The only creature that I can reference it to is a pterodactyl, even though I know that sounds crazy. Have you heard of other similar sightings in this area? I truly believe I was abducted by aliens a couple of months ago. My dreams of my house were too vivid to be dreams. Something happened. I remember standing at the patio door looking up. The ship was huge with two, three, or four big lights. I remember a red and white light. I knew I was looking at the back. But instead of seeing my backyard, there was a field with two cars. I think the one closest to me was a red convertible with the top down. There was a woman leaning against the car. I think she had dark curly hair. Darker than mine and softer curls. I think one or two men were sitting in the car drinking. These details are too vivid and too memorable to be a dream. The ship was a very strong material. Gunmetal gray in color. From what I saw, the house blocked the rest of the ship. I was looking up. The clincher is that I was jolted awake in bed. I turned over and the clock read 526 of them. I felt like I had just gotten in bed and I was exhausted. I didn't want to have to get up and go to work. I turned onto my left side and my first thought was that I'd need to get checked out for any implants. I tried to find something on the internet to tell my story, but didn't find anything in that short time. I told my best friend last night and she doesn't think I'm crazy. When I wrote it, I wrote things going on in my life before and after. There was no break. Also, I remember when I wrote this how calm I became. To clarify how I saw the ship, I have two sliding glass doors going outside. I have to open both of them. I remember seeing everything in the den as it is right now, not like a dream where everything is distorted or made up, and I was standing in the house at the first door, with both open in my, probably, nightgown that night. I was looking up, and if I had stepped out and jumped up, I could have touched the ship it was that close. I have metal awnings, but that night, it was like they were gone. Because the ship was so close, and the view I had, that's why I could only see the back. It was like I was being dropped off. I didn't feel strange or funny or have any weird things. Supernatural things do happen to me at night, but as long as I pray, it helps. I now wear a St. Michael the Archangel medal that was blessed by the Pope and pray to him each night also, and that has helped tremendously. To clarify being exhausted, have you ever gone out one night and partied and got drunk, not too drunk, but enough to know you're drunk and you came in at four or five or six of them? Then you throw yourself in bed and you're asleep before you've stopped moving. That's what I felt like. I had gone to bed the night before as usual. But when I was jolted awake, I looked at the clock sea above and literally felt like I had been dropped into my bed and that I had not gotten any sleep. My best friend is the only one I told about this because I'm too scared to talk to anyone else. Maybe I watch too many TV shows and movies. 
but I have not spoken to anyone about this. I've thought long and hard and I wanted to report this, but I don't want anything bad to happen to me. It was a hot summer day and I decided to go for a hike on a trail I had heard about from some friends. They had mentioned that it was common for people to skinny dip at the end of the hike, and the idea of taking a refreshing dip in the cool stream sounded like the perfect way to unwind after a long hike. As I walked along the trail, I saw a few people sunbathing in the distance. Wanting some privacy, I decided to head upstream to find a more secluded spot. As I continued along the path, I noticed a lone man on the trail. I politely stepped off to let him pass assuming he would continue on his way. I finally found a quiet alcove where I felt comfortable enough to strip down and enjoy the cool water. I quickly undressed and submerged myself, feeling the refreshing sensation of the water against my skin. Just as I started to relax, I felt a sudden sense of unease. To my horror, the man from the trail reappeared, standing only a foot behind me, completely naked. He attempted to strike up a conversation, but my instincts were screaming at me that I was in danger. I muttered a response and quickly scrambled out of the water to get dressed. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I began the three-mile hike back to my car at a rapid pace. With no cell service in the area, I knew I had to rely on my own instincts to keep myself safe. Every rustle in the bushes, every snapping twig, sent shivers down my spine as I hurried along the trail praying that I would make it back to my car without incident. When I finally reached my car, I breathed a sigh of relief, grateful to have escaped the situation unharmed. From that day on, I vowed never to hike alone again, always opting for the company of friends on my outdoor adventures. The memory of that terrifying encounter serves as a constant reminder to trust my instincts and always prioritize my safety. It was a quiet night as I drove down the narrow country road, taking my friend back to his village after a long day of hanging out. The clock in the car read just after midnight, and the only source of light came from the dim glow of the headlights cutting through the darkness. As we approached a small bridge, I noticed a peculiar sight, a small cloud-like formation slowly drifting across the road. Just a bit of fog, I thought to myself not an unusual occurrence on these country roads. My friend, lost in thought, was staring out the window, oblivious to the foggy apparition up ahead. As we got closer, I expected our car to pass through the fog, but what happened next left me baffled and frightened. Instead of us driving through the fog, the fog seemed to pass through the car itself. It seemed to defy the laws of nature, as the misty cloud moved right between the two of us and out through the back of the car. Startled, I jumped in my seat, gripping the steering wheel tightly. My friend, who hadn't been paying attention to the road, was equally shocked by the phenomenon. He confirmed that he had also witnessed the fog passing through the car, leaving us both bewildered and struggling to make sense of what had just happened. We spent the rest of the drive discussing our eerie encounter, trying to come up with a rational explanation for the strange fog. But to this day, the experience remains unexplained, a chilling memory that lingers in our minds whenever we find ourselves driving down those lonely country roads late at night. As a kid, I dreamt of being an officer like my father and his dad before him. It kind of ran in the family. So every time I was sitting in the passenger seat of my partner's cop car, it was even more special. It was my very first night, and my partner kept joking on me, ripping on me, and calling me a rookie. But I didn't mind, I was very familiar with the hazing process. It was a boring night. My partner made attempts to break the silence by asking me all sorts of various questions. Other than that, it was silent, not much was happening. We looked around for somebody to apprehend, but to no avail so far. Not much of a first day. We kept on driving with nothing happening until I saw a figure standing on the corner. I told my partner, is that something there? I pointed to the figure that I can now see was a taller man standing with his head to the ground. She looked around for a bit before shaking her head and concluding it was probably just a homeless man. 
We drove off. I looked out the window as we passed. He turned his head and watched as we drove off. I thought it was weird, but not weird enough to get involved. We kept on driving when we got a call on the radio. Five on 150 on South and Boulevard. My partner picked up the radio and told them we'd be on the way. I faintly remembered the 5 to 150 from training. It had something to do with the crazies. We took a turn to get there faster, and in less time than I'd imagined, we pulled into the house and property they described over the radio. Loaded our weapons, exiting the car, I looked around again. A very quick scan of the neighborhood. That's when on the corner opposite of the one we had come in, I saw him again. The man from earlier, looking down at the floor. I tapped my partner and motioned towards him. She looked at him, and I can tell she was just as confused as I was. She whispered to me, you get in the house, I'll go talk to him. I nodded, heading into the house. It was huge, and to my knowledge, abandoned. Hello, it's the police. Is anybody there? Just then, from a heap on the floor, I heard somebody speak. You need to leave now. Go. It was coming from a man holding a wound on his side and bleeding badly. Sir, who did this to you? I asked, flashing the flashlight in his direction. Get out. Get your partner and get out of here before he gets mad. He said, fear audibly in his voice. Who gets here? I responded, hearing a little bit of fear in my own voice. He opened his mouth, but before he could speak, there was a gunshot that got both of our attention. I ran outside to see my partner now face down. The man she was talking to was nowhere to be found. I rushed out to her side, kneeling down beside her, flipping her over before checking her pulse. I felt nothing. To show her respect, I closed her eyes before setting her back down. Unholstering my weapon, I walked back into the house aiming at but to my surprise, the now bleeding man was not there. The house was empty, and his spot was a streak of blood heading out the back door, which I saw now had been busted open. I ran through, looking around. There, at the corner of the fence, stood the tall man, looking down. All right, you freak. Hands up. He didn't move. It's like my badge and gun meant nothing to him. He did not fear me. What are you hard of hearing, I said. Put your hands up, trying to make my voice sound more macho now. And that's how we're playing it, I said fed up. One, and two. Before I could get to three, he turned to me, looking at me. What I saw made me drop my weapon. His stare felt cold, but he could not be staring at me. There were two empty spots on his face where his eyes would usually go. I stumbled backwards into the house, nearly losing my balance but catching myself in the sink vomiting a bit. I was still shaken up by everything that's happened. It all happened so quickly. I stood over the sink, waiting for the urge to vomit to make a reappearance, and I'd heard footsteps approaching. It was the man I saw before. He came in, wiping the blood from his shirt. He was not injured at all. I'm sorry, it was truly nothing personal, he claimed with a smug smirk on his face. You see, my boy has this craving for human flesh, and a boy's gotta eat. He continued to walk towards me. What is wrong with his eyes? I said frantically, considering I was more than likely going to die. He was born without them. Doctors can't explain it, but my boy didn't let it get him down. He doesn't need eyes. He goes by his hearing and his smell. He looked out the door, and here he comes now. I knew what was coming. Just thinking about that freakishly tall, eyeless man and my partner made me sick. I vomited all over the man and myself. He took a step back and called me a disgusting fool, explained to me there would be no mercy, and I ran as fast as I could, grabbing my radio and calling for backup immediately. I actually had to drive down the street to try and hide from this person until my backup arrived. He and his son were detained, and as it turns out, he had actually cut out his son's eyes as a part of some sort of sick, satanic, sadistic cult and fed him H flesh his entire life, treating him like a wild animal. As far as I know, him and his son are still serving time in prison. Nineteen forty two. My sister, Clara, 
and I were thrilled to be spending time with our family at Medivemps Lake. Our parents and uncles had taken us on a week-long fishing trip, and we couldn't have been happier. The lake was a beautiful, serene escape from the world, and we eagerly embraced the opportunity to fish for smallmouth bass from the rocky island near our campsite. Each evening, as the sun began to set, Clara and I would head out to the island with our fishing gear, eagerly anticipating the catch we would bring back to our family. The island was a magical place, with its rugged rocks and the sound of water lapping against the shore. It was there that we felt closest to nature and the wonders it held. One night, as we sat on the rocks with our lines cast out into the water, we heard a strange howling noise echoing across the lake. It was unlike anything we had ever heard before a melodious singing from someone with a husky voice, haunting and beautiful. Clara and I exchanged puzzled glances, unsure of what could be making such a sound. The singing continued for several minutes before it abruptly stopped, leaving us even more curious and a little unnerved. We decided to pack up our gear and head back to camp, eager to share our strange experience with our family. The following evening, Clara and I returned to the island, unable to resist the lure of the lake and the chance to catch more fish. As we sat on the rocks, the sun setting behind us, we once again heard the eerie singing. This time, however, we were not alone. From the shadows of the island's trees, two enormous, hair-covered giants emerged, their eyes fixed on us with an unsettling intensity. They stood at least eight feet tall, their bodies covered in thick, matted hair, and their faces a mix of human and animal features. Frozen with fear, we watched as the giants approached us, their hands outstretched towards our bucket of fish. Without a word, they took the fish, their eyes never leaving ours, and then disappeared back into the shadows from which they had come. Clara and I sat in stunned silence, our hearts pounding in our chests. What had we just witnessed? Were these creatures some sort of undiscovered species, or perhaps beings from another world? We couldn't begin to fathom the answers to our questions. We returned to our campsite, our story spilling out in a jumble of excited and frightened words. Our family listened with a mix of skepticism and concern, unsure of what to make of our tale. In the years that followed, the memory of that night remained etched in our minds, a reminder of the mysteries that still lurked in the world. Our encounter with the hair-covered giants would remain one of the most extraordinary experiences of our lives, a moment when the veil between the known and the unknown was briefly lifted, revealing the incredible possibilities that lay beyond. This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom, headed down to my nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in passenger. It was around 11 p.m. and we're 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of the road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it and both agree on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, my mom's words, as if it were emaciated and its rib cage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color, but my mom said she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see forehair. It had long limbs and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be loping using its front limbs to pull itself along, and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the hell is that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights. And I swear on my life, 
It stood up and ran. Not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my nana about it to avoid scaring her which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked, I don't think any died. But if I remember correctly, there were a few horses that were severely wounded. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. When my dad was a kid, he and my grandpa went to my grandpa's land to prepare the soil for planting crops. Bored, my dad wandered off to a nearby stream where he saw a bunch of human-like dolls playing around in the water. He said they looked like adults, only smaller. With proportions like dolls, not sure what exactly that means. They splashed around in the water, and at times it looked like they were even walking on it. They signaled at him to come and play with them, and my dad ran over excitedly. He said he played with them for a while when my grandpa noticed that he had wandered off and went to find him. When my grandpa found my dad seemingly playing alone by the stream, getting all wet, he got super mad and dragged him away. Apparently, my grandpa and grandma were never able to the duens whenever my dad would point them out. My dad still recalls looking back while my grandpa yanked him away and seeing the duens waving goodbye at him. After that, my dad started seeing the duens around the house. They'd pop out from behind walls during dinner, and my dad would try to feed them scraps of food, much to my grandparents' annoyance. Eventually, they got worried and took him to a local curandera. She did a little ritual and told him to keep a cigarette behind his ear for a week. And then, the duens were gone. He never saw them again. My dad swears it's all true, even though no one believes him, and he's embarrassed about even telling the story. The only reason he told me it was because my mom teased him about it the other day, and I forced it out of him. I love these kinds of stories and really wanted to share. If you have any Duen stories, please share. I'd love to hear them. My aunts and uncles say Duens aren't always so friendly, and told me some other creepy stories about them. My best friend Vinny and I were out riding our motor scooter on a beautiful sunny day. We had been coasting downhill when the road started to rise, so we kicked on the motor, approaching a level overlook area of a clear cut about the size of two football fields. Before us, at the far end of the field, down below near the trees, something astonishing caught our eyes. A massive creature arose from a fetal sleeping position, it was a Bigfoot. It looked straight at us before swiftly heading south with its arms swinging. As it passed a stump, it took one giant step up into the forest and disappeared from view. We almost fell off our scooter, scrambling to grab our camera and binoculars while trying to process what we had just witnessed. The creature was huge, with a flat face that clearly wasn't a gorilla. Vinny insisted that we explore the area, so we carefully walked down several feet of clear-cut debris to the spot where the Bigfoot had been sleeping. All we found were impressions where the creature had been lying down, but nothing else. We noticed that the stump it had passed was eight feet tall, and the creature had been chest high over it. The single step it took into the forest was at least three feet tall. We were both in awe and terrified at the same time. It was October 1993, and my cousin Jane and I were excited to embark on an elk hunting trip on Vinegar Hill. The area was known for its abundance of elk, and we were hoping to bag a big one. Little did we know that our hunting trip would turn into an unforgettable adventure. As we trekked along the creek, we came across a large muddy spot. To our surprise, we found five enormous Bigfoot tracks leading into the mud. Each track measured 20 inches long, and they were spaced far apart. Jane and I exchanged puzzled glances, wondering if what we were seeing was real. The following year, during elk bow hunting season, 
we found ourselves back in the same area. The memory of the Bigfoot tracks still fresh in our minds, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. As we hunted in the daylight around 2 p.m., we suddenly heard a loud, piercing eek sound echoing through the forest. Startled, we both dashed back to camp, our hearts pounding. At sunset, our friend Jeremy joined us at camp. As we discussed the day's events, Jeremy noticed movement by a bush and between three trees. He squinted, trying to make out what he was seeing. In the fading light, he saw a dark, shaded figure moving through the trees. It was tall, around six and a half to seven feet, and walked upright like a human. At first, Jeremy thought it might be his brother, but as the figure disappeared into the woods, he realized it was something else entirely. We couldn't help but think back to the Bigfoot tracks we had found the previous year. Could it be that we had just seen the elusive creature responsible for those massive footprints? We later learned that the area was honeycombed with mines, raising the question of whether these creatures used them as shelter. Though we never had another encounter with the mysterious figure, our elk hunting trips on Vinegar Hill would forever be tinted with a sense of wonder and curiosity about the legendary Bigfoot. While on a deer hunting trip, my father stopped the vehicle on the side of the road to have lunch. As myself and my three brothers ate, I noticed movement several hundred yards away out of my peripheral vision. I realized that something was up in a tree near the very top of a huge pine tree where the branches are just beginning to grow at the edge of the timber cutting area. The area had just recently been logged. I looked at it with binoculars and was frightened when I realized that it was not a bear but a huge man-like creature picking something from the treetop. I looked at it for several minutes. It was very dark brown and had its legs and at least one arm wrapped around the tree. It kept reaching up and grabbing stuff like it was collecting something. Then suddenly it turned to look in my direction when I saw the face very clearly. It had no hair near the eyes and nose which looked humanoid and definitely did not have a snout like a bear at all. Then it did a double look then realized that we were watching it, and without any notice just pushed itself away from the tree and free fell at least sixty feet to the ground with its feet and body staying in the prone position all the way. When it landed it made a very loud crashing sound into the freshly logged clear cut. My father screamed at us to hurry and get into the vehicle, and we drove away fast, and he never talked about it to me again. My brothers did not see it because they were looking in the wrong direction with their binoculars. Very spooky, though. I had just finished a long walk through the forest. The smell of decomposing leaves filled the air, but suddenly I caught a whiff of something far more pungent. It was like a rotting animal carcass. As the smell intensified, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. As I walked down our dirt driveway, I heard a deep snort like a huffing noise. It reminded me of the sound a horse makes when it wants your attention. Intrigued, I looked around and saw a large male Bigfoot standing there, staring right at me. I was both fascinated and terrified at the same time. With my heart pounding, I took a cautious step, and to my amazement, the Bigfoot mirrored my movement. This continued for about five minutes with the creature copying my every action. Feeling a mix of excitement and fear, I decided to run back to my house to grab a camera. As I fumbled to find my camera, I thought about the park ranger, who had been a friend and confidant for years. He had shared numerous stories about unusual sightings and unexplained phenomena in the forest. I couldn't wait to tell him about my encounter and show him the evidence. But when I finally stepped outside, camera in hand, the Bigfoot was gone. Disappointed but still eager to share my story, I went to the ranger station and relayed my experience to him. The park ranger listened intently, his eyes widening with each detail I shared. He told me that there had been other reports of similar encounters in the area, and my story only added to the growing mystery. Together, we went back to the spot where I had seen the Bigfoot, but there was no trace of the creature. The park ranger promised to keep an eye out for any future sightings and urged me to do the same. From that day on, every time I ventured into the forest, I couldn't help but hope for another chance encounter with the elusive Bigfoot.
It was the end of August, a perfect time for a vacation, and I, Donald, had decided to indulge my hobby of prospecting for gold. So there I was on the Chetco River, about 18 miles northeast of Brookings, hoping to strike it rich. And guess what? I found a vein. But that's not the story I want to tell you. What happened next was far more exciting and much more terrifying. After a day of exploring the area, driving the dirt roads in my trusty old Jeep, I had decided to take a break. I parked the Jeep by the road to let the engine cool, the very dry and steep slope lined with thick brush just a few feet away. Visibility into the undergrowth was no more than 15 feet, but it was peaceful, serene. Then, without warning, the tranquility was shattered. Something charged at me through the brush. I couldn't see what it was, but I could hear it, a rustling sound that grew louder and closer. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. Whatever it was, it was lurking in the brush about 35 feet away. I could hear it moving, but I couldn't see it. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I felt a cold rush of adrenaline. Thoughts raced through my mind. Was it a bear, an elk, or something else? I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread. I needed to protect myself. I rushed to the trunk of my Jeep and pulled out my magnum gun. I'm ready for you, I muttered, trying to sound braver than I felt. But nothing happened. Whatever it was, it didn't come any closer. The confrontation, if you can call it that, lasted about three to four minutes, but it felt like an eternity. Shaken by the experience, I decided to consult a local park ranger. A friend had introduced me to Ranger Ben, a grizzled veteran who knew the area like the back of his hand. We discussed the possibility of another animal bear, elk, or even a cougar. But Ben wasn't so sure. You know, he said, leaning back in his chair, there are stories around these parts. Stories about a creature living deep in the woods. Some call it Bigfoot. I scoffed at the idea, but deep down, the unease lingered. Was it possible? Had I had a confrontation with Bigfoot? I guess I'll never know. But one thing's for sure, that vacation was one I'll never forget. This incident happened back in 1995 when I was 15 years old. It was very horrible. I witnessed two guys that may have been like government agents or some other secretive governmental agents. They kidnapped my dad and left someone in his place that looked just like him. I later found out that the person left behind was a reptilian cloaked as a human. This person became rather rude to me as time went on. However, he talked with me and he could even heal with his bare hands. He told me that we humans were looked down upon as sheep, etc and he knew I had witnessed the two agents kidnapping my dad, and he said I was next. I became very scared. He had me taken to a place against my will, and met with what looked like a special forces group who forced me to sign paperwork against my will, and the guy who looked identical to my dad was standing there. I was spying on him one night and saw what looked like a snake's tongue come out of his mouth. I later discovered he was a reptilian, a very short human who looked like a midget was helping him. I think he was a gray cloaked human. I heard them talk in English, but then started talking in alien lingo which sounded kind of far eastern. Yes, I am here to tell you they can cloak and simulate our world undercover. My real dad, the one I saw whisked away, was retired military and I often suspected him of doing something or being involved with the government or doing something secretive that may have led to all this happening to me. I also found implants that feel like something under my skin. One was an upside down triangle or diamond shape. They also stabbed me and then heated me with their eyes which left a very weird scar on my leg. I never told anyone as I was so scared of how these entities seemed to be able to operate with impunity and like nothing could stop them. They also conducted very horrible activities and what seemed like mental brainwashing experiments on me. After all these years, I'm still scared to this day. But I believe it was time to come forward. I just wonder what happened to my real dad. My family and I had decided to take a trip to New Orleans, the city of jazz, voodoo and legends. We checked into an old, historic hotel in the heart of the city, 
excited to experience the unique atmosphere that surrounded us. One night, after a day of exploring the city, my dad and I settled into bed, the room enveloped in darkness. The only light seeping in was from the lamp post outside, casting eerie, dancing shadows on the walls. My dad was already sound asleep, his steady breathing a comforting presence in the room. I lay facing his back, my thoughts meandering through the events of the day. Restless, I rolled over to face the other side of the room. That's when I saw it a shadowy figure of a man wearing a hat and a long coat, clutching a briefcase. I strained my eyes, but his face remained indiscernible, as if he were an outline or a shadow, rather than a physical presence. He just stood there, still and silent, an eerie sentinel in the dark. Panic surged through me, and I wondered if I was experiencing sleep paralysis. But as I shifted my body, blinked my eyes, I realized I could still move. My heart raced, my mind grasping for an explanation. Was it a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination? The figure remained, an unwelcome intruder in the room. I never experienced anything like that again, but the memory of that night in New Orleans has lingered, a chilling reminder of the unknown. I've shared my story, curious to know if others have encountered something similar. What was it that I saw that night, a specter from the past, or just a figment of my imagination? The answer remains shrouded in mystery. The day after my girlfriend and I saw the Mothman prophecies in the movie theater, we found ourselves driving up a road situated in the middle of Jefferson City, Missouri. The movie was still fresh in our minds, and we couldn't help but feel a bit on edge. As we made our way up the big hill on Southwest Boulevard, an unexpected event took place. Out of nowhere, a bird-like creature that bore an uncanny resemblance to the one from the movie suddenly bounced off my windshield. The impact startled both of us, and I remember thinking that I had never seen anything quite like it before. Right when the creature hit my windshield, my girlfriend cried out, Whoa! The first thing that crossed my mind was how much it reminded me of the bird-like thing from the movie. Just as I was thinking that, my girlfriend said, that looked like the thing in the Mothman prophecies. Though it wasn't the seven-foot humanoid creature with red eyes and wings that the movie depicted, it still left us feeling uneasy. I couldn't bring myself to look back and see what happened to whatever it was that hit the windshield, nor did I have the nerve to stop and investigate. Maybe I was too freaked out, or perhaps I was worried about what I might find. To this day, I still wonder about that peculiar sighting in Jefferson City, Missouri. Whether it was a mere coincidence or something more inexplicable, the experience remains etched in my memory serving as a reminder that there are still mysteries in this world that defy explanation. I have heard the story of the Quaker man who left Philadelphia to start a new life in the mountains of Pennsylvania. He was a man of strong faith, and after purchasing a large lot in Cook Township, he found employment at the Old South Mountain Iron Works. The land was perfect for him, with a stream full of brook trout plentiful timber, and lots of open space to raise a family. He soon met a young woman and fell deeply in love with her. They were married by the local justice of the peace, despite the fact that she was not of the same religious faith as he was. However, they were happy together, and she soon became pregnant. In the final month of her pregnancy, the young wife began to experience bouts of anger and intense pain. The doctor could not diagnose the cause of her malady, and ordered her to complete bed rest. The Quaker had a horrible dream that the devil had come to visit their home while he was at work. He was sure that his wife was possessed by a demonic being and that he needed to purge her of this evil. For 10 days straight, he knelt by her bedside, invoking prayers and charms, much to the chagrin of his wife. However, his wife soon became disgusted by the fuss her husband was making. In a fit of rage, she grabbed a small wooden cross and flung it out of the window. She declared that there was no God and that the devil was only a creation of a feeble mind. That very night, the Quaker's wife went into labor. She told in agony for the entire night and into the early morning. A midwife was quickly summoned for the delivery. Soon after daybreak, the child started its way into the world. 
As the midwife coaxed the new mother to push, it soon became apparent that this child was unlike any she had ever witnessed. The newborn boy resembled a beast, not a human. It was alive and breathing, but did not cry or make any sound. It was gray in color and had more scales than skin. It had a long tail and small horn buds above its pointed ears. There were claws for hands and hooves for feet. It also emitted a foul, lingering stench. This was the embodiment of Mephistopheles. The Quaker was horrified and could not believe that this was his child. He refused to even touch it. The midwife, who had seen many things in her time, was shocked and did not know what to do. The child lived for only a few minutes before passing away. The Quaker's wife died soon after giving birth. The Quaker was left alone with his thoughts and his beliefs. He eventually left the mountains and returned to Philadelphia, where he tried to reconcile his faith with the terrible thing that had happened to him. The story of the Quaker and his wife has been passed down through generations. Some say it was a curse, others say it was a punishment for the wife's blasphemy. But the truth remains a mystery lost to time and to the mountains of Pennsylvania. Okay, this happened a couple of years ago, before we turned 18 and before uni started. So we had a lot of spare time and nowhere to spend it so my friends and I would often just walk around our town at night talking about random stuff. On the night in question, it was just me and one friend, and we were just walking without really paying attention to where we were going since we were in pretty deep conversation. We found ourselves walking towards an entrance to a footpath that's behind an estate. There's a fork in the path and going left will eventually take you to the high street and a train station. Going right will take you to some fields behind a cemetery. We went right, which sounds like a dumb idea, but it made sense at the time because you could get into the cemetery through the fields and then onto the estate where we lived by coming out of the cemetery. Initially, I didn't even want to go down the path in the first place. I'm scared of the dark and generally would rather not walk through a graveyard and a bunch of creepy forest baths at night. My friend reassured me though, and after all, it was the quickest way home. About five minutes in, the path leads through a small wooded area and after that there is the gate that opens into the cemetery. It's really dark in this part, except for some distant lights from houses allowing you to see a little bit in front of you. That's when we saw a figure in the distance, walking towards us. From what I could make out it just looked like one guy, probably a similar age to us because teens would often use this path to get from one estate to the other. I quietly told my friend that, and he agreed. We weren't worried because while there are some bad kids in our area, people don't really give you any trouble when they're on their own. As the person walked closer to us and us to them, I realized it was not a teenager, but a really tall man. Trying to calm myself, I remembered a tall guy I see a lot walking his dog, a big Alsatian. Yes, it must be him. I scanned the area for his dog, but I saw nothing. However, the man was holding something long in his hand. I thought it was a lead for his dog, but it wasn't flexible, and in the dark and in my paranoid state, I thought it looked like the handle of an axe or a spade. My friend and I hadn't said a word since the man got close, but I just knew he was thinking the exact same thing as me. I didn't want the man to notice that I was staring at him, so I just looked down and walked as fast as I could without running. Thankfully, the gate was right there, and once we got into the cemetery, we felt safe. Once we got out into the open, we started talking about what we saw and my friend agreed it looked like an axe or really big stick and said I was expecting to get a blow to the head as soon as we got near him. I babbled a bit, sorry, but I certainly stay away from dark paths now. Hello all. I wanted to share these two stories I have from my childhood that have always stuck with me and still creep me out to this day. Story 1. This story is short, but makes me feel uneasy, nonetheless. I was in kindergarten as Mrs. Quigley's class. I loved her when she got a call from the office that someone was there to pick me up. I think this was before the time of, like, emergency contact forms with designated people to sign you out. Because this happened so long ago, I can't remember if there was a name given or not. But I do remember being five years old and not feeling right. 
I told Mrs. Quigley I didn't know that person and didn't want to go with them. She didn't make me and I rode the bus home as usual that day. I can't help but think that situation was something bad because I don't remember it ever being a problem that I didn't get picked up that day like it wasn't planned, and it wasn't inconvenient that I didn't go with them. Story 2. My cousin and I were playing outside in a wooded area near her house, and this wooded area was also next to a road. I just remember we were playing in there then this pickup truck stopped on the road next to us. I don't remember what he said. I just remember taking off and my cousin tripping over a branch and falling. I was too scared to help her. Back when I was younger, around 12, 13, my three friends, and I also the same age, had a fort right at the tree line by some woods near our neighborhood. Right next to the tree line was a series of fields used for sports, so technically our fort was on that property and not the woods. Separating the woods from the fields was a large chain-link fence. One day after a large storm, one of the trees from our fort was knocked over. Leaning against the fence, naturally as kids, we thought that was awesome except for ruining part of the fort. We all climbed up on the tree, sat on it and whatnot. After some time we were just sitting there having a conversation when I noticed one of my friends who was not on the tree was looking kind of past us, on the other side of the fence. Uh, guys, he said in a shaky tone. We all turn around, and on the other side of the fence about 20 feet away was an old man. He was dressed in tattered clothes, including a newsboy hat. He looked to be in his mid-fifties to sixty. He stood there smiling at us. I definitely sensed some malicious intent with him. Which is creepy in itself, but the part that gets me the most was how long he must have been there watching us, easily fifteen-twenty minutes before my friend noticed. And what seemed like forever, none of us spoke and all we could do was stare back at him. My adrenaline kicked in and my reaction was to just run away, where my friends also followed. After a few minutes or so we gained the courage to go back, and when we did he was gone. It kind of scared us and we really never went back to that fort. Now the fence is replaced and the fort is gone, but my friends and I will never forget that creepy man. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.